Good morning, beautiful people, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Good, welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I'm very excited to present this very special guest. His name is Awo Omo Tosin, and he is a Baba Lawa uh, priest. We're going to talk about Baba Lawa a little bit, what that is um, within the Ifa tradition. And um, it's a Western, uh, West African tradition of cosmology, Afro cosmology. And um, I was an actual priest. And so that's the reason why I really brought him on, because I was curious, having my own background in Latin America when it comes to um, Afro spirituality components and cosmologies. And we're going to talk about his um, education as well and his background. We have a lot to discuss today. And this is a very curious episode because a lot of my audience members are going to be introduced to a very new topic, but I'm sure we're all going to learn today with Awo and myself. But I just want to say, Awo, thanks for joining us for this episode 94, and welcome to Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. Uh, my brother, thank you as well. Peace and blessings. Happy Black History Month, and um, many, many blessings. I'm very, very grateful to be on your platform and you know being able to talk about just everything that you just mentioned. So thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And it, the funny part about these episodes is I've had personal connections with people on here. And it's usually the people that I have close, close proximity to. And those tend to be the interviews where I'm more nervous. But I don't I shouldn't tell the audience that. But you guys know how I am. I'm transparent with my audience. I don't have a problem sharing my feelings at, at times. But um, I want to give a brief ad before we start with this very um, important conversation. It should last around two hours. I want to say thanks to all my listeners and all my viewers, especially um, this is a YouTube channel exclusive now. You all know this already. I've explained in a few episodes before. And I just want to say that that's where the traction has been. And we've reached over 180 different countries, pretty much every part of the world we've, we've reached. We have 44% um, of our audience located outside of the United States. So this is a true international community. We're talking about a 56-44 split. So that tells you kind of the influence, um, the international um, influence I like to see on the show, the diversity, um, ideological diversity, not just cultural diversity, but the way we think in our minds. That's the most important thing we want to emphasize on Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum is to um, use a little bit of your time to expand your mind. And remember, you can't unthink free thought. And having said that, please consider subscribing to us for free. It doesn't cost you a dime, just a little bit of your time. And um, this is independent media. You're supporting a true independent media channel. And um, we're going to have just so many perspectives reflected on the show as we've had in the previous 93 episodes. And so this 94th episode should be a very special episode. It's going to be dynamic and quite informative. So I'm looking forward to doing this with Iwo. I just want to um, turn the floor to Iwo and kind of let him introduce himself to the world because he's new to my audience. So. Kind of give us and spend as much time as you want as far as um where does your journey lead you from here to there as far as um you know even before we talk about Ifa, like where what's your journey? What is your journey? Oh wow. Well, you know, I'm a I'm a being that came onto this planet uh VIA Cleveland, Ohio. Uh Cleveland, Ohio is where I was born and raised at. And then uh, my parents um we're primary from an area in Cleveland called the Glenville area, which is primary uh, African American area. Um, East Cleveland, where I grew up at as well, is also an African American area as well too. So that's where I was born and raised at. Uh, went to school there. Went to a school in Cleveland called um, Shaw High School in East Cleveland. Uh, graduated from there. That was the high school I went to. Left there, and then end up going to University of Cincinnati, which is in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, Cleveland is in the northern part of Ohio, but Cincinnati is in the southern part of Ohio. Um, I went to, I graduated in 1985 um, from um, Shaw High School, ended up graduating from University of Cincinnati in 1994 with a uh, bachelor's degree in criminal uh, criminal justice with a minor in urban planning and uh, African-American studies. So African-American studies has always been one of the primary things in my life as well, too. Um, after um, graduating uh, from the University of Cincinnati, I went back home for a couple of years and I ended up moving to Nashville, Tennessee in 1996. And that's how I got to Nashville. Um, I wanted a you know, different change of life and wanted some different things. I wanted to get out because that's always been part of my personality is to kind of seek the rest of the world, see what things were about. 
But as we get into this conversation, we'll get to see that what really put me here was my ancestors, um, and which is really, really interesting in terms of people's journey in life, how you get pulled into different directions or different parts of the world, not knowing why. And when I came to Nashville, I did not realize until years later, probably around 2000, I want to say maybe 2011, 2012, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit um, sooner than that. But I went home one summer uh, while my uncle was living with my father's um, brother, his uh, baby brother, and he still lived in my grandparents' house on um, 9509 Pierpont Avenue in Cleveland, Ohio. That's the Glenville area. And I went home and we got to looking at pictures and we were looking at different people through the pictures. And I got to looking at some some real, real interesting pictures. And I saw this one brother, um, bald head, dark skin, have a bald head just like mine. And I'm looking and I get to looking at all the information on obituary because it was obituary I saw one of his pictures on. And I'm looking at the picture and I'm looking at some of the information on it. And it's like, man, Patton's funeral home. I'm like, man, that's Nashville. And, and you know, and I'm starting to look and I'm getting curious. I'm like, wow. So I'm getting to look a little bit further and a little bit further. And, oh, wow. And come to find out, man, my grandmother was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Come to find out everybody on her maternal and paternal side of the family were born here in Nashville. And the crazy thing about it is that me and my daughter, I have four children and three grandchildren as well. Uh, but my daughter and I were actually drive, we should drive past this school, I mean, this our church every morning because uh, she went to Meg's Middle School, which is in downtown, right in the downtown area. And this church was sitting right on the corner where her school was at. We would go past there every day, not knowing that this is an establishment and a foundation that my great grandfather great yeah great great grandfather had built and uh, actually i think he started i think he built it in 1940 i could be off on the time it was around 1940 when it was built because um his house was two down his house was two doors down from that uh church he was the methodist minister so he was two doors down from that particular establishment and that establishment now where his house is, it's like a, it was, uh, I think it's still a food storage or a place where the homeless come to and they get food and things of that nature. But it blew me away that we were driving past this place every day, not even realizing that this was part of our energy, part of our ancestry, part of the things that's part of my collective as well. And then I did some more research and then ended up finding him in Greenwood Cemetery right off of Elm Hill Pike. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the, um, one of the uh, oldest African-American cemeteries in the city of uh, Nashville or in the area of Nashville or in Tennessee as well. And found out that we have about five family members in there, in that particular cemetery in one spot uh, where it actually goes back to 1863. So it's interesting how you can start one place and end up somewhere else. I mean, because Cleveland is always going to be home. I love Cleveland. That's my home. Um, but at the same time, I had to come here because I do realize that there were some things that the ancestors wanted me to do. That, that is so amazing. And and you hit on something there, just the um, the connectivity between people. I think it's so important. Like we, we all, we have something in common. We have shared experiences, some kind of way, shape or form, whether it's through ancestry, experiences, what have you. And the fact that, you know, what's the chances of that happening? You've been from Cleveland and you're not having any idea about this history, this ancestral history right here in Tennessee. And you're now in Tennessee since when? 1996, you said? Yes, sir. 1996. Yes, sir. That's that's absolutely amazing. Um, That kind of a story. And you can't make it up. You really can't. Yes, and sir. Um, it, it kind of goes into... Um, things that we've discussed, um, you know, previously at work or whatever, I, I think it's curious. We actually, we met through work. Yes, sir. And, um, I, um, I disclosed in a couple of episodes before, I believe it was episode 89 with um, Zach Hyden, the mad redneck. We were talking <laughs> and, um he had a journey uh, too. Uh, he runs an automotive free clinic in Alabama and um, he's a southerner like I am. I'm born and raised in Tennessee. Um, even though it may not seem like that at times, but um, we were discussing the episode, um, just things that we're going through. And, you know, we have PhDs, but it's like people expect us to be somewhere else. But, you know, why are you working at Walmart at night, Kiko? And it's like, you know, my circumstance may be different from other people, 
but I think things definitely have a reason behind them. And um, my mom works there too. And so I was like, you know right. what? I had a great experience 18 years before working at Walmart. So I'm going to give it another go around, you know, until I make this other transition because mm -hmm. I still teach. I'm teaching right now. But right. it's, um, I met, I will at work. And um, we both kind of have the disposition that, you know how it is when you feel like you may share knowledge that other people may not be interested in, you keep it to yourself. And so I talked to Iowa and it's, it's, it's almost as if we've known each other for years, like the yes, way sir. we started talking. And um, it's amazing the stuff that you shared with me just in our brief um, history of knowing each other just over a month and a half or so. And um, I want you to share that a little bit with the audience um, as far as when people hear the word EFA, for instance. Um, a lot of what you've discussed as far as ancestry, references to ancestry, um, that may go over some people's heads. But before we even get deep into Ifa, what is the connection between, what's the importance of having ancestral ties as it relates to Ifa? Well, it's, you know, one of the things in the, in the, in the Yoruba concept, and, I, and I, I'll kind of go into one of the old dudes that speak about this. It says I only stand tall. I I um stand tall because I stand on the shoulders who came before me. And I'm and I'm paraphrasing. I might be a little bit off on the words, but I stand tall because I stand tall on the shoulders of those who come before me. Right. So in Ifa, it definitely teaches you to respect your ancestors, to venerate them, and to and to and to always remember the legacy, the great things that they've done for you in terms of the sacrifices, in terms of the hard work in terms of things that were put out for you to even be here right now, which I think is a which is something that our young folks today do not understand at all because they do not have that connection. Is it their fault? Not at all, because again, you have to have good teachers in front of you to teach you about, you know, that ancestor connection. But ancestors in E5 is a very, very important concept because it speaks about how to go back and to tie into those energies that got you to where you are right now because you came through that energy to get to the planet. As you come to that energy to get to the planet, we know there's sometimes not good stories or bad. Sometimes there's good stories and sometimes there's bad stories. You know, we hear about some of the great people in our families who've done miraculous things in terms of, you know, um, giving you money or giving you knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, um, had a great life, had a great profession, had a great career. And then you have those situations where you have ancestors too that, you know, they didn't do too well you know um their life was not the way it's supposed to be they may they may not have lived their full potential in terms of understanding what they were what they came here to do in this lifetime so in ifa what we do is and and again what ifa teaches is to always honor your ancestors good bad or indifferent right because what you want to do is you want to venerate them because as as in our tradition you can always send them light even though they leave the planet or or this particular planet, or they go into what we would consider to be um, or room. That's what they call heaven and Ifa. Mm -hmm. I like to also call it the mystical realm because when people leave the planet, you know you can't just get in your car and go there and just say, well, let me just go visit these people in this invisible realm. You know, um, we understand from energy that energy never never energy tells us that uh, energy is neither created nor destroyed. So mm -hmm. the energy goes so well. So that's why we that's why I call it the mystical realm of life. But in this space, these ancestors have their energies will continue to move on. Our job is to help them elevate. That's another concept we learn in Ifa is to continue to help our ancestors elevate. And we send them love, we send them light, we send them prayers because the ancestors also become like guardian angels too as well. Because that energy does move on, you help them elevate. Um, some don't need elevation because they did great work. They elevated while they were on the planet Earth. And what we do understand is, is that our job as beings while we're here on this planet is to elevate so that we can become an ancestor. See, that whole concept about being highly elevated, that highly elevated means that you can become an ancestor. Now, you hear in some places that, well, everybody doesn't become an ancestor because they didn't do that great. They may have to come back and repeat the lessons again. They may have to come back and do this journey again because they didn't get it the first time, right? So one of the jobs as an Awo or actually being in Ifa um, is to always send love and light to my ancestors, no matter what position they were in life, to help them elevate. 
um, to help them change that energy, even in the mystical realms of life or whether at now, once they leave the planet. But most importantly, is to always continue to support them for the things that they did for us while they were here on this earth. Amazing. I, I appreciate the explanation. You did so well with that because I'm going to be throwing so much within the conversation. And I know you probably followed some of the episodes before. There's really no order, but it's kind of meant to be that way. There is an order in my mind. And I take notes constantly. I always prepare with notes. But sometimes the questions aren't in a chronological order. I don't like those types of styles. Yes, sir. I think it's more organic when it's more conversational. But I want to touch on something um, as far as Ifa is concerned. And the audience is probably like, what the hell is Ifa? You know, it's like they haven't even discussed what it is. Um, I briefly mentioned it when I introduced Iwo. But um, in a paragraph, what would you... Um, describe Ifa as as far as like a definition if someone on the street or anyone you encounter said what is Ifa Awo like what would you respond to them I would tell them it's an African spiritual science in short they're gonna probably say well what is an African spiritual science right <laughs> I'm laughing right but because it's a science that helps you understand how to stay in alignment with your destiny how to stay in balance with yourself by using the forces of nature, as we would say, fire, water, air, and earth, but we also know them as we also know them as Orishas, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Ifa is very simple, and how it was always taught to me from my great teachers and how it was passed down to me, it's just really about helping you stand in alignment with your destiny. It's about having balance by again using the forces of nature. Um, Ifa was also known as Isheshe, um, out of Africa as well, too. Um, now, as Ifa traveled around the world, you know, during slavery, because um, Ifa actually um, um, originated in Nigeria, which is southwest Nigeria. That's where it originated at. As the slave trade went on or took place and they started to take, you know, our ancestors and people from that area. Um, you know, we know Brazil got the largest amount of, of African-Americans, well, South America, so to speak. And then you got the West Indies who got the next part. And then America got the least amount of the slaves in the slave trade. Um, but as it went around, then it took on different denominations. Now it took on just like anything else. Anytime a spiritual system leaves its origination or its original area, it's going to take on different names because people use it to fit what's going on within their area meaning that now they're going to add the cultural aspect to it um they'll keep a lot of the tradition but they're going to start to add the cultural aspect to it so now it takes on a new name but in this particular situation as Ifa went around the world we do understand that um during slavery they had you know the slave codes in many parts of the world you couldn't drum you couldn't dance you couldn't speak it's a lot of things you couldn't do so our ancestors were very, very wise and smart. And what they did was they ended up synchronizing Ifa with the slave master's religion so that the, that, the, that the system could continue to live on. It's a good possibility, and I'm going to use the word possibility, that if they did not do that, that the system would not have lived on because it would have died out. But they got smart. So, you know, what they ended up doing, because a lot of the uh, people that were bringing them to these different places, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Spaniards, and people like that, had a Christian uh, Christian uh, Catholicism background. So we got smart. You know, that's one thing about us. We're very, very smart. We know how to do things. So now we ended up taking the Catholic saints and and, and equating them to the Orishas. And therefore, we would practice what the slave master wanted us to do during the daytime, <laughs> but at night we would practice what we wanted to. And that was a heavy sacrifice because I can't imagine trying to take that load or that burden on or even that responsibility on, trying to keep something alive that was part of your family, part of your tradition. And look where it is now. It's still going on even to this day. Um, so yes, you get Candomblé that came out of um, Brazil, Santeria, Lucami, um, that also comes out of the West Indies as well too. Um, you even hear the word Vodun, right? Mm -hmm. Vodun, you know, took place, you know, in, in, in Africa as well, too, right? In the Nigeria area as well, too. The Fawn and the Dahomey folks, right? Uh, you get to see a lot of it in, in, in Woman King as well, okay? Um, you get to see a lot of Ifa in Woman King, which is beautiful. I love that movie, too. I loved it a lot. But um, 
but you also get to see the word Vodun, which is also synonymous to Ifa and um, the Orisha as well, too, because it's the same thing. You know, it's it's an African science. And what it is is studying the cosmology of the world and the universe itself. And that's how our people look at things, you know. And I'm giving the, I'm giving the easier the easier terms today so people won't get too confused because, you no, know. No, you're, no, you're perfect because I'm going to accompany what you're saying. No, no, you just keep doing your thing and you talk as much as you need because um, this is so crucial. Like you're here to educate us. We're educating each other. And the audience is learning alongside us. Um, no, but that's perfect. Um, a little bit longer than a paragraph, but I wanted it to be longer than a paragraph because I love to talk. I know you do too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. But, um, Definitely. As far as Ifa is concerned, I'm going to tell you, I, will, I was, um, we were introduced, and that was the most intriguing part when we first had this deep conversation when we first met at Walmart. At night, everyone else is like, they were, worried about work and completing a task and we're working too but we're also stimulating our brains at the same time you know on a break right. and i'm thinking we got introduced to this completely different ways we're both black americans you're from ohio originally i'm from tennessee originally but me being a professor i was introduced to it through academia um my dissertation director dr don duke um, it's from Guyana in the in the Caribbean in South America. It's mm-hmm. a country that's north of Brazil in the Amazon. It's got Amazon characteristics and it also has Caribbean characteristics. So it sounds like the accent in Guyana can be someone in Belize, someone in Cuba. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, she considers herself Caribbean. But I took a course of hers called Negritude. Mm-hmm. Um, and Negritude was a was a philosophy that started really in the, the late 20s, the 30s, kind of around the same time the Harlem Renaissance started. It was like a way of um, people spreading uh, more um, Black philosophy, philosophical thought. You may hear people like Franz Fanon, people like yep. Leon Damas, people like mm-hmm. um, uh, Leopold Senghor, who used to be the president of Senegal. Um, they all came together and they hung out in Paris a lot and they came up with this concept called negative which is basically a black way of thinking quote unquote as far as philosophy is concerned history a way of reframing this westernized colonized um things that you just refer to as far as like the transatlantic slave trade or anything that you may mention that we've always had to deprogram and uh, reprogram ourselves to um understand and get people on the same page as learning our real history and our real thought processes. And um, I, I learned it through a course, but see, I learned it because I speak Spanish, I speak four languages. Santeria mm-hmm. was kind of my introduction to Ifa. And Santeria is just one um, part of a longer tradition. And you mentioned that this is all from a Yoruba tradition in yes, Nigeria, sir. Ife Ife being the headquarters of this cosmology called Ifa. And um, it's still there today, Yoruba land, Nigeria. And um, I learned it through a Spanish-speaking way. So when I was introduced to Orishas, which are spirits, we're going to talk about some in a second. And I'm going to let you kind of explain to the audience when I have the PowerPoint, like maybe what's the function of each Orisha or how it maybe differs from um, what my experience was with this. Because um, full disclosure, I'm an atheist. But I use this as a tool because I, I respect my ancestry. I respect um, people in general. This is part of the human experience. And so I teach my students um, about Ifa, Santeria, Vodou, um, Candomblé, all the stuff that you mentioned before, because um, it's not only a part of my like um, thought process and upbringing when it comes to philosophy and my program, being a literature background, because the writers that I dealt with talked about Santeria, Bodo, all this stuff in their writings. And so naturally, I'm going to be amazed by that and, and gravitate towards that. And so I teach my students that, and they learn more about it. I don't care what background they're from. I'm teaching them all this stuff. Te- they know all the Orishas and everything like that. But um, how were you introduced to this? Uh, I, I can't imagine the journey you took or whatever, because I was just introduced through college. Were you introduced also through college? And how does it differ from me having a Spanish speaking background versus you being in the States. So it's real interesting because I, you know, me, I'm, I never thought about, you know, 
I got I got attracted to African spirituality when I was in college, my first year of college, because um, at the University of Cincinnati and me and you kind of talked about this, that during the during the 80s, 80s was a 70s and 80s was a very good time for African-Americans in terms of knowledge, wisdom and understanding. You have black bookstores, you have black symposiums and you had the heavy hitters hit. John here, Dr. John here, our, 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 our beloved ancestors. So let me send them a lot of love. Eba Rock to New Bobbles. Because you had D Dr. John Henry Clark, you had um, Dr. Ben, you had Ivan Van Sertema, uh, uh, who was a uh, chancellor. When you still had these heavy hitters still around at that time. Dr. Francis Quest Wilson was still living at the time. Uh, you had Malifia Asante. Uh, oh my God, man, we had all these great heavy hitters during that time. And it was even very conscious in our music as well, too, especially during the early 80s when um, hip hop. Um, about 84, probably 85, 86, the concept of hip hip hop just took uh just took a whole nother direction. But anyway, I got introduced into college at the time um by this information. I took a class in 1986 uh, called The Black Man that Dr. Eric Abercrombie, who's also a very um very, very positive influence on my spiritual journey, Dr. Eric Abercrombie from University of Cincinnati. And uh, he taught this class, and that's what opened me up. Prior to that, that summer, I started reading a lot of stuff about African history. But then what ended up happening was, was that after I went and took his class, that, that next summer, I started reading Message to the Black Man by Elijah Muhammad. And when I read that book, a Message to the Black Man by Elijah Muhammad, that opened me up tremendously. Because I had, you know, being in East Cleveland, East Cleveland is all black. Um, and the area that my parents grew up in, um, the Glenville area is all black as well, too. So we grew up with a lot of Muslims, you know, because when you when you are when you are up north, especially in the northern cities, it's a, you you surrounded by a lot of the Muslims, you know, um, Sunni, uh, Sunni Muslims, but then also Nation of Islam Muslims, um, the more science temple Islam started by Noble Jura Ali. Um, as well as the five percent nation, which was started by Clarence 13 X Father Allah. So you're around this stuff all the time, you know, and you see them on Saturdays and they're out just like everybody else on the street with the with the Christian folks and the seven day Adventists, And you mm -hmm. got your Jehovah Witness. And then, you know, you got other um, uh, conscious black folks out there on the street. Everybody is like it's almost like a swap meet selling information. Right. <laughs> but really, they're they're out there to wake their folks up or wake people up. This was my this was my introduction to start waking me up. And so. After I took Dr. Abercrombie's class, I started reading messages to the black man, and that was my zenith. That was my takeoff right there. When I took off from that point, I never looked back. Um, because I'm hearing stuff in message to the black man, like, oh, man, the black man is God, and, you know, we got to treat ourselves with respect, and, you know, black man stand up straight and tall, and I'm like, wow, this is mind-blowing, because never heard that before, you know, didn't hear it in the church, because I grew up Baptist because uh, my family family's primary Baptist, and uh, I started, I started, I stopped going to church at 17 years old. It just wasn't for me no more. Do I disrespect the friend? No, I don't. Um, I still support my friends and family who may want to walk down that path. That's just not the path for me, right? And if for me at 17 years old, I decided that I wasn't going to take that path anymore. But um, again, going to the University of Cincinnati, um, studying um, some of these classes. And another class that I had was um, by another professor named Mr. Dr. Vibert White. He was in the Nation of Islam, too. And he had done some very, very valuable work as well, too. And I took his class, African Spirituality. And that's the first time I ever heard anything about Ifa because he had talked about Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> Remember Ricky Ricardo and I Love Lucy? Mm -hmm. And uh, Ricky Ricardo, we used to sing a song, Babalu, Babalu, Babalu. And I'm probably off, but it had the Babalu connotation in it, which is an Orisha. Mm -hmm. uh, Babalu Aye deals with the pestilence, the sickness, and the earth. And I'm like, wow. So at the time, I didn't put two and two together, but it wasn't until years later that I started putting two together that my journey was about introducing me into the, it was it was coming in little bitty spurts up until when I finally got introduced to it, which was right around night, which was around 1998, yeah, around 1998. Because before then, I had been introduced to the Kemetic system out of Egypt, uh, the Kemetic system, and the original name of Egypt is called Kemet. 
-hmm. they had a very very beautiful system egypt is the is the european greek is the european greek name for egypt but the original name is called kemet so i have been studying the kemetic philosophy before i got to ifa and the kemetic philosophy is what opened me up to ifa because they have a lot of similarities in terms of in kemet they call it the netters but in ifa they call it the orishas and so uh my big brother um, named um, Dr. Bakari, Adana Jal Bakari, he teaches um, at MTSU. He teaches African studies as well. Um, he's a he's an Awo as well. And um, how I actually got introduced to it was through him, but it was because I was going through a situation in life at the time. My grandmother had just passed, and I took it very hard. And I kind of went into a, a moment of silence for about three weeks to a month, even maybe two months. And we had a brother's group in Nashville that we had just started called Brother to Brother. And we were getting together frequently. And I just kind of, you know, had been kind of missing for a little bit. So one day I called Baba and uh, we were talking. And, um, you know, I said, man, I apologize for, you know, being out of the loop for a minute. You know, I just I had to take some time because my grandmother passed. And, Man, it's been hard. It's just been really hard. And he said, oh, brother, you know, because he's got such a loving spirit, man. He said, oh, brother, don't worry about it, man. He said, you know what? I got something. I got something for you, right? Now, previously, before that, I had that conversation. He had talked about Ephon stuff like that, about feeding your ancestors and all this other stuff. I was like, well, I could barely feed myself. How am I going to take care of some ancestors? So we never really, we, we, we briefly talked about those conversations, but we didn't talk about it until my grandmother passed and that's when the conversations got deeper and that was my first interest or my first informal initiation into Ifa. because what he did was he set up an ancestor shrine in the bedroom that I had and I ended up move, eventually moving up into my uh, bonus room but he set up that ancestor shrine in my room to help me make that connection to my grandmother and that was my takeoff right there that was a takeoff because it opened up a portal for me to go through in terms of really now understanding my spiritual path and opening up that door to my grandmother as well. Open up the door to my both sides, my maternal and my paternal sides of my family, because now I'm I'm just amazed by this. I'm like, wow, you can sit here and communicate with your ancestors and you can sit here and, and do certain things, certain rituals. Um, to to make sure that everything's appeased with your ancestors and they would continue to come back and help you. So that was my journey. That was my trajectory. And then um, after that, it was just different levels. You know, um, first way my the way my path went. You know, I ended up um, receiving my ancestors because each house, or you will heal each ile, which is like a temple. Ile also means earth as well too. But each temple. Um, have this is where the cultural stuff comes in that sometimes because the cultural stuff sometimes people would do different things in their houses or do different things so mm -hmm. i started off getting my my ancestors first and that was the most important part of my journey because again it allowed me to go walk through this door if that door wasn't open um, i don't think i would have been where i'm at today in terms of spirituality but that opened the door for me and then from there on um moving up through the system and I've been in the system from that point, was it 98, 2018, 20? It's been almost about 26 years now that I've been in the system, just from that particular day. So it's those kind of things where you think that, you know, you may be one way, but if you really are spiritually inclined and you are really a, a spiritual person, there's going to be different things that are going to come to you on your path that's going to open you up or awaken you. Sometimes we have a tendency to ignore them because we're just not ready at that time. You'll hear in the African tradition that when the student is ready, the master will appear. But the master that will appear is not so much a human being. Now, the human being will introduce you to it, right? But the real master is that energy that people may know as God, goddess, creation, or whatever name they have for that invisible energy. That's the real master. And that master will meet you on the other side. Master, masters, I want to also say that for our female or, or women who may be on here as well to acknowledge the divine feminine. But that energy will meet you on the other side. And it will ask you, are you ready to meet me? And when it does, it's going to take you through a journey on different steps with your spiritual journey. Um, and it all doesn't come at one time. It comes in spurts. It comes in different times. And that's a good thing because sometimes, you know, we have a concept in Ephraim that says, Spirit can't give you what the head won't accept. 
-hmm. That means that your head, because in E5, there's another important Arisha um, that it gets really ignored a lot of times. It's called the Ori, your head. The Ori is everything in E5 because there's stories in E5 where, it's, where it speaks to that um, if all the other Arisha leaves you, your Ori would never leave you, right? Because your Ori is your head. It's the most important aspect. Um, in the in the um in the shock in the um in Reiki they will also know it as your crown chakra. Christianity will know it as Christ consciousness in terms of this head, okay? Because your head is so important because it's it's it can easily be programmed. I mean, you kind of talked about that before in terms of how beings when they come through their mother's womb on the planet Earth that they're easily programmed with education, other people's agendas, age, all these different things, and people have a tendency to lose themselves. And as people have a tendency to lose themselves, they have to come back and refine themselves again. That means that the head got programmed. That means somebody was up there messing with the head. So in E5, the head is a very, 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 very important concept. We have to take care of this. Uh, we we do certain rituals and, and uh, it's also called Ibori, where we also go and we wash our heads. We take care of the head. We do different rituals with that as well. We do different prayers. The head is so important. But there's three components to the Ori, the Ori, the Ori Inu, and the Ipanri. The Ori Inu is your inner self. The Ipanri is that mystical energy that you can't see that when you blow the breath out of your mouth, that's that energy that stays with you for the rest of your life and even after your body dissipates. That's that energy. That's your, that's your, um, your soul energy that people will compare it to. But that's the energy that's in your body, or we will also reference, reference it as the ashe of your body, mm -hmm. meaning that this energy is the energy that stays with your body until the body dissipates. But the ori is the most important component when it comes to um, any of the reaches in your head. So when it goes back to the, what we were saying earlier about being mature, yes, the, student, the master will appear, but the student has to be ready to accept that information. And as you know and I know, it's a lot of people that's just not ready for that information or they get the information and they don't know how to handle it. Or if they don't know how to handle it, they use the information in a, in a, in a very inappropriate way that they don't know how to either speak on it or they heard what somebody else say versus in studying themselves. So in E5, uh, we're very, uh, especially with my teachers, um, my teachers are very emphatic about research. Um, I know I mentioned Dr. Um, Baba Bakari, but I also had two also influential teachers too, which was um, Baba Colioso and Ia Usha Nike. I also had a couple other teachers here too in Nashville, uh, Ia Ola Omi and um, Baba um, Shango Bami as well. They were very good. All the teachers I've had, uh, Kiko, have been about really pushing you to research, to study, not just giving you lip service and not just standing in front of you like we see, and please forgive me for saying this, but how we see in other religions. Mm -hmm. No, you can church. say what you want on here. You don't have okay. to apologize. <laughs> Primary to church, how you get this lip service, but nobody's pushing you to go beyond the questions. Nobody's pushing you to be a seeker. I, I hear Sadhguru talk about this all the time. He's an Indian mystic. He mm -hmm. talks about this all the time, about our real journey as spiritualists is to seek. Um, the minute that you say that you know something, you just delimit yourself. You didn't just cut yourself off. Because there's so many layers to knowledge on this planet. There's so many layers to knowledge overall. But we are seekers because the more you seek, the more you understand. Because as you know and I know, it's so much to learn on this journey in life. You're not going to learn everything in this lifetime. And I've come to understand that now. As, as much as I want to know everything, no, I'm not going to know everything. But that also ties into this, this thing called the mysteries of life. We're, we're studying the mysteries of life. But the biggest component of being in E5 or any spiritual systems is understand the mysteries of yourself. You know, I think me and you were talking about this other night. I'm, I'm walking past you. And I'm looking. I'm, I'm, I talked to one of our main priests. Um, um, uh, damn, I got you have to remember all these names. Um, Swami G, Baba Swami G. And uh, he's one of our priests in the Institute. He has a um, PhD in astrophysics. And um, I remember a long time ago, he said, you know, one of the challenges that he had being educated, especially in these educational systems, you know, whether it's elementary school or getting a PhD, which kind of talked about why we end up in certain jobs, man, because we get to really see the real deal on education after a while. Mm -hmm. 
but he was talking about how um, he realized that but all the stuff that he learned in physics that he only understood maybe one, two percent of the universe and that the other 98 percent was unknown. Now, let me tell you what's really funny about this. Now, we had this conversation years ago. I'm listening to uh, Tyson Neil deGrasse, the, the astrophysicist, black astrophysicist. And uh, I'm listening to him the other night say the same thing, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we only know about 4% of the universe, but the other 90%, 96%, the dark matter that's attached to this gravity and all these other things is unknown. So we only know about 4%. So what does that tell us about ourselves? We can relate this to ourselves. And my godfather used to talk about this all the time. He used to say all the time that we only use maybe like 2 to 3% of our brain, but there's a whole nother 98% of the brain that we don't use. So what does that tell us? You have to unravel the mysteries of yourself in order to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Because, man, I tell you, there's so much to learn. But the way that we're programmed in this society and how we're programmed overall, people would tell you that, you know, you're smart because some people might have a better way of, of, of remembering. You know, some people have a good memory. Some people don't. Everybody's functioning in terms of learning is different. Right. Mm -hmm. So. I might learn one way, but you might learn another way. Is that wrong? No, it's not. But because the way everybody has has controlled this educational system, if you don't remember and can't remember things when you get to test day in terms of what you just regurgitated in your mind, because you and I know the education system is just a bunch of regurgitated information. They don't work with you in terms of your gifts, your tool, mm -hmm. and what's really in you. It's It's all a setup. So I had to learn early on that for me, spirituality and how this master will appear in my life was really about, was I mature enough to be able to accept it was in front of me? And so you get these certain teachers. You might get certain teachers at different times that will come into your life um, that will open up doors for you, present different information to you, because after you, it's, it's like going to school in a sense. You got these different levels. And after you get through these different levels and you go through these different doors, the next thing you know, here comes another door that's open. I learned that in the Kabbalion, uh, one, of the, one of the books that also, this is a very, very spiritual metaphysical book, the Kabbalion um, by Herman Trismegistus. But that's also a book that we know that was also taken from the Houthi out of Kemet. Um, it says that when one door opens up, there's another door that will open up. So the doors are always open up all the time. You get through one door, here goes another door. You get through one door, here comes another door, right? So it's all upon your maturity. And I think people fail to realize is that it's all about growth. And then let me just say this. I'm, I'm respectful as well, too. Sometimes knowledge or certain things that are given is only what people can handle. So, yeah, you got the three baby religions. Maybe that's all they can handle. They can't handle that. <laughs> when you say the three baby religions, <laughs> the three baby religions, you know, it's Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Those are the baby religions. I'm quite sure there was something that came after that as well, too. Mm -hmm. But pro you know, people look at those as like the major religions of the planet. But, <laughs> yeah. but those are the ba they're baby religions compared to Kemet, Ifa, Native American, um, South American traditions, um, Indonesian um, um, systems, uh, Southwest Pacific spiritual mm -hmm. systems. You know, these indigenous spiritual systems, man, been around for almost 15, 20, 30,000 years, man. And you take them, they only been around, what, 1,500, 1,600, 2,000 years? So they're, they're babies, but um, they are so, I guess the word I want to say is because they're baby in comparison um, a lot of times that a lot of people don't understand is that that's not the it and no all to everything is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Do they have some great, th of course, all books, if you read them, you can get anything out of any book, right? But it's not the end to know all to everything in life is what I'm trying to also say as well, too. So this journey is really about studying everything. It's about studying everything, anything that you can get your hands on. But that's what Ifa teaches us, too. Ifa teaches us to study everything. We even got old dudes in Ifa where it said, you could go to any church, mosque, or shrine as long as it's for your greatest and highest good. Because in Ifa, we have a thing called Iwa Peli, which is, which is um, balanced and good character. Right? But you hear us a lot always in Ifa talking about, was that for your greatest and highest good? 
not for your good, but it was for my greatest and highest good, right? So as you study things, you take things on, was it for your greatest and highest good? So as we take these things in spiritually and we and we can uh, take this information and, and start to break it down and use it for ourselves, was it for our greatest and highest good? Our career, our education, the knowledge that we're taking in, anything that we're doing, if it's for your greatest and highest good and it's going to propel you to live in alignment with your truth, then I'm all for it. But that's what that master is about on that other side of the door. That master on the other side of the door is about opening up doors so that you can begin to learn and get yourself educated or learn to be educated in a way that's totally different from the school aspect. Wow, that, that's so amazing. Um, th this, this is amazing. Like this experience right now, this conversation, now hopefully the audience is getting just as much um, um, joviality out of it um fun rejuvenation out of it as i am right now like this is just exciting learning more about the world about yourself about other people um on this planet i want to um something you said there that stood out when you talked about the baby religions um and like i said before i don't even get caught up in the labels and i know that you did an episode with tira um, and that's you sent me the video and I watched that most of the interview. I, I do things on purpose, like not watching everything, but certain parts stood out. And you talked about um, this whole idea of um, it seems like to me, the baby religions have a formula. Um, you have these concepts like heaven and hell, um, purgatory. You have concepts like bad and good. It's always like a hard line stance, it seems like. But if I, from what you've described and from what I've learned about it, just, um, you know, in, in the spurts that I've kind of learned about it, I'm learning, you know, way more about it, obviously, you know, being a priest. It seems like it's a wide open, all encompassing experience with the person is not there's no limit to what you can know or not know, as opposed to a doctrine where turn to this chapter or turn to this book of John, book of James, it, it seems like a, a completely different conceptual mind. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's interesting, right? Uh, I remember uh, one of my Babas, uh, Baba Shango Bami, he's in our world too. I will uh, Baba Shango Bami. And um, we had a great, great mystical teacher in Ifa named Baba Metahochi. And uh, Baba Metahochi was, ah, oh, man, this, this, this elder was something else, man. I mean, he was uh, phenomenal with the knowledge, man. And I never got a chance to meet him, but I got to hear about all his teachings, right? And uh, one of the teachings that Baba Shango Bami had told me about Baba Metahochi was, but he said that Ifa was nothing more than bringing all the scrapings of the earth together. I thought that was powerful. Mm. Bring all the scrapings of the earth together to come up with your own reality or your own truth. Right. And I'm like, wow, that's powerful. Right. Because when you think about it, your journey in life is is it's 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 like being in a universal classroom, just like we're in a universal classroom right now. You know, and I tell you this all the time when we're at work that I learn from you. I'm listening to you speak. We learn, we learn from each other. Because what people don't understand the way they've been programmed <laughs> again is that everything is a classroom. Mm -hmm. So this classroom gives you the ability to learn and to grow in ways that you would have never grown before. The three major religions, I think what people have to understand about these three baby religions or just religion in general is that religion is based off cultural, philosophical, and theological ideas by a group of people that lived in that particular area or who created this religion. That's their thought process. They decided to put this together for a lot. I mean, you could go, we, we could spend a whole nother four hours on that in terms of political, governmental, trying to control the people. Um, and the reason why these religions were created most of the time was to control the people. Mm -hmm. What people don't understand is that religion is to control people. Because when you take on the philosophical, theological concepts of any religion, you're taking on the thought process of another group of people, period. And I say that, I'm not saying you can't learn anything out of that, but I don't want that kind of control in my life. You know, I want to be able to think for myself. So when you got people like, I was just speaking about like Baba Metahochi and you got people in the world night like a, a side guru, but then you could even go back to Dr. Ben 
And you can go back to John Henry Clark, Dr. John Henry Clark, when they was telling you to think for yourself, do your research, understand your information. I just heard Professor James Small just say the same thing the other night. You know, we got the research. You know, you research the history, it destroys the mystery. You feel what I'm saying? You, you do the history and you study the history, it destroys the mystery. And I'm taking that from, from Professor Smalls, and I'm paraphrasing because I might have messed that up. But I heard him say something close to that, right? We got to do our research. So, yes, E5 and the teachers that I've had, oh, man, especially, uh, you know, my, my teachers, Baba Colioso and Ia Oshunike, they push us to learn other things on purpose, on purpose. And I say that in a very positive way. You got to study everything. Man, I used to sit up there and watch Baba, man, in conferences, Baba Colioso, and he would have a very wide audience, just like what we're dealing with right now. And it would be a particular topic. And this, this great teacher, Priest King, would take this topic and he could use E5, but then break it down in every other aspect so people could understand Christianity, Islam, mm -hmm. Judaism. And he's pulling stuff everywhere, right? So you are correct when you were saying at the beginning of our conversation, E5 is a spiritual science that pushes you to really understand self, which is an ancient comedic principle. Because know thyself is the most important aspect. Why? Because even the ancient Kemet and in E5 and all of our indigenous um, spiritual systems, if you did not know thyself, which is the energy beneath you, why it came into your body, why am I here? What am I here to do? What is my purpose? What is my truth? If you don't know those things, you could read a million books and it's never going to make a difference because you're programmed and locked up by other people's thought processes, philosophies, and ideas. The whole gist of being on these spiritual journeys is to become spiritually liberated. You ain't going to never hear that. They ain't never going to teach that in religions either. Spiritual liberation. Now, what does that mean? Spiritual liberation means that when it's to elevate yourself on this planet, but when you leave this planet, you will not be tied down to nobody's philosophies, ideas, genders, or anything. You will be the free energy just like how you came in. You'll be the free energy just like how you came in. But we also know that as soon as you come out that womb, that, that beautiful woman's womb, there goes the process of programming. You Programming is one of the hardest things that we are being challenged with today in today's society. And the bad thing about it is the rich people, those are still doing well, do not understand how programmed they are. And I get it. You know, you're living a beautiful life. You got money. You're doing whatever, whatever. Um, you know, you just think things are great, but you were conditioned by someone else to think. You were conditioned by someone else to take on a certain thought process. I don't want to be like that. I want to be free, not just free to walk around because people don't understand the real concept of slavery is how you is how you control the mind. That's one of the reasons why when we were, when Africans were taken into slavery or any group of people, any human being on the planet, whether they were African or any other um, group of people on the planet, when they were taken as slaves or they were made into slaves or they were captured or how they were taken in, first thing I do is take this mm -hmm. because a lot of times when they make you a slave, they give you the religion of the slave master. Because when you take on the when you take on the religion of your enemy, you just lost the whole battle right there. Because now you got you believing in the enemy's concepts, you believing in the enemy's ways of thinking, you believing in the slave master or the conquistador or the, any one of those who have conquered you as a group of people or the colonizer. We can use all those different words in different ways, but they have colonized you in a way to you no longer think for yourself. But you're walking around thinking, oh, I know everything, I know this. Not realizing you do not think for yourself. That program is, is, is so crucial. So you're right. Going back to the main gist of your question again at the beginning, what you were just saying about Ifa pushing you to have this wide open way of thinking and being able to step outside the box. Because when you think about it, how can we put God in a box? Something yeah. that's so <laughs> infinite. That's true. Even, even that word G-O-D doesn't describe. See, I can easily understand why a person is an atheist because I have. <laughs> Let me say this. I'm going to say this real quick while we're in this piece of the conversation. Oh, no, you're good. Um, I love the concept of atheists. You know why they say I don't believe in God? It's the concept they don't believe in. I think a lot of them are very, very, very smart. They understand that there's a power that's much greater than all of it. They understand that. They don't believe in the concept of G.O.D. because that is a 
mismanufactured word for that energy. That energy is infinite. It's like I tell people all the time, well, if you know God is above, which you could be really pointing down because as the earth is turning on the axis, as the earth is turning, are you pointing down or are you pointing up or are you pointing to the side? You really don't know. You just, <laughs> again, programming. Let's go back to programming. You're only doing this because somebody told you to do this. You're only doing this because, again, it was passed down to your family in terms of what their religious preference was or what their religious affiliation was. So you just saying stuff just because somebody told you. This is where this programming goes back in at. But that word G-O-D is not a good word for that energy. Your scientists tell you that. The, indig the indigenous people told you that. But the thing about it is, is that the reason we get so many names for that invisible energy because those cultural names. It goes back to what we talked about again earlier about taking on the philosophical concepts and theological concepts of another group of people. So all those names that we put on this invisible energy only took place was because in that particular area of the world, this is how that group of people saw it. That's what they looked at it as and say, huh, you know what? We're going to call this, this invisible energy this name, okay? It sits there, and depending on how that particular religion, philosophy, or concepts get around the world, because we know it got around the world through either missionary or conquering another group of people, and then you're introduced to these concepts, and all of a sudden it's like, throw your stuff out the window and take ours. And that's how a lot of us got the religions that we are now. I mean, in short, we know that we got Christianity because the majority of the people that enslaved us, other than the Muslims, because the Muslims enslaved us as well too, um, gave us their way of thinking and gave us their God. And they always said, if you want to make a slave, the first thing you do is you give them their God, you take away their religion, and you take away their customs. Now, guess what? Now I can tell you anything. I can I can do anything. I can do anything to you now because you don't know who you are. And that was one of the main reasons why, from from some of the research that I saw, that when um, some of the um, our ancestors when they had babies, they would take the parents away as much as possible because now the parents couldn't teach the child. So now, or they would get rid of the parents, kill them off, sell them off, or do something to them so they wouldn't even be around the child. Because guess what? Now I can program you the way that I want to. Now let's take that up to modern times. It's it's <laughs> it's the same concept, just in a different way in today's time. So it's very important that as an awo or somebody in Ifa who has these concepts, because I tell people all the time that the beautiful thing about Ifa, Ifa is what made me understand all these different spiritual systems. Ifa is what pushed me to understand everything around me, right? Because it made me dig deeper into these truths, into these concepts, right? Because when I'm looking at, you know, um, the Orishas, right? And you look at some of these Orishas, and you're talking about the forces of nature, right? The forces of nature are energies. Well, let me let me let me give you the educated part of it. You hear this a lot in Ifa that the Orishas were what they would call deified ancestors, meaning at one time they did live. Okay. okay. While you do this, I'm gonna let you. Continue talking. I'm going to do a PowerPoint. I'm going to share the screen so everyone can see okay. it. And um, because that kind of goes into what I was wanting to do with this. Um, and I want to go back to something you said too earlier when you mentioned mentioned atheism, the the issue with categories, the problem with categories. Oh gosh, it's just so much going on through my head right now. But it's like <laughs> I, I'm going to let take your lead right now, and then we can go back to that, and then we can go back. You know, we can go all directions. We don't have to go a straight line or a crooked line. We can go whatever line we want to go in. Um, let me share the screen so you can, and you tell me if you can see it or not. Sure. Can you see that? Yes, sir. I can see your screen. Yes, you sir, can brother. see my screen? Mm-hmm. And you can see that um, image right there? Oh, I love it. I love it. And this is actually the main um, slide that I use um, when I teach my students about um, Santeria, for instance, which is a part of this um, broader tradition mm -hmm. um of ifa it all comes from ifa but um as i was mentioning earlier when this was transported across the atlantic ocean it went under different names and uh, haiti could be vodou in cuba it could be Paulo mayon bay it could be um mm -hmm. lucumi it could be santeria in brazil it could be um candomblé 
uh, there's lots of different ones. Um, it, even in Uruguay, like anywhere in Latin America, because 94% of um, the black people that were brought over against that will, which is known as, um, you can call it the Middle Passage, the Transatlantic Slave Trade, whatever you want to call it. 94% um, of those people are actually in the Caribbean, um, Brazil, other parts of Latin America. The United States and Canada only received about 6% of those people that we're referring to, which is ourselves. And that's important to realize because the diaspora um, causes a lot of confusion with some people. The diaspora, meaning the people who have been spread around the world post slavery, colonization, everything else. But like I was mentioning still, I mean, we still have colonized minds constantly. I mean, the colonization has never been stronger. It's been as strong as it's ever been. And so we're trying to decolonize still in 2024, um, unfortunately. And you have black people in the States um, mimicking, ridiculing their own cosmology. I understand um, the cosmology, even though I don't, I don't understand everything about um, Afro-cosmologies, but I'm still searching for things. Um, but some people are just stuck in their box. They grew up uh, following a white Christian religion, whether it's in the black church, wherever you're from, and they really believe that that's the way, not mm -hmm. considering that that is a colonized mindset automatically. And that's honestly how I became an atheist. My introduction to atheism actually had nothing to do with reading a book or nothing. It mm -hmm. was simply from my dad being a free thinker that he is and putting two and two together. Okay, I'm in Tennessee as a Baptist. How does that make any sense at all? Because I know my ancestors didn't practice baptism. Right. They didn't practice that in Africa. So how is it that I have an English last name or whatever the hell the last name is, our surnames are, whether it's Scots, Irish, or whatever the hell it is, French or whatever you may have, I mean, it's still from the European colonizer. Yes, and sir. So the religion is also a part of it. It's not just the name. It's everything. It's your mind basically being retransferred into something that you're not. And so we're actually trying to recuperate what we were at an original point, an earlier point of existence. So yes, that's kind of where I, I, I have the ultimate respect for any spiritual system, honestly, and yes, especially Afro-spiritual systems. And people say, Kika, you're an atheist. And I'm kind of getting off topic a little bit. So I am kind of going to the atheism topic. And now I promise we will talk about Ifa. And um, I will, will explain some of these Orishas. And we will talk about that and then his priesthood as well. But um, atheism is a category. Um, I'm a black person. A black atheist may not be the same as a white atheist. What does that even mean? Even the concept of race was something that was created um, in 1414, what was a black person? It didn't exist. There was no such thing as a white person in 1414 because the new world concept changed that. Exactly. All that changed as a result of the colonization experience, the mm -hmm. same way the religious experience changed for us. I mean, everything changed, the whole work of way of life changed. And that's what people have to understand before you mimic um, you know, your own culture before you watch the next stupid Hollywood movie that shows mm -hmm. the media poking into the doll and you having a cramp in your leg because that's um a curse put on you because that's what the productions in Hollywood's trying to make you realize about something, make it negative when it's not there's just complete misrepresentation of what it is. They don't even tell you what it is, where it comes from. Um, is so basically ifa in popular culture is ridicule um and we're trying to de-ridiculize this and explain it and educate people what it really is about and um one more thing about the atheism component free thinkers forum kiko's free thinkers forum free thinker people automatically associate atheism secular um conspiracy theorists there's a it, it's ambiguous on purpose and i do that I'm thinking just generally speaking, free thought mm -hmm. process. That was my first right. original um, idea going into creating just the title of this form, for instance. But then you think about like atheism. If you're caught up in these labels, even if you identify as an atheist, and I know a lot of my friends do, if you're insecure enough to be like, okay, we're you talking about that, Kiko, 
but you're an atheist, you've already lost the plot. If you're truly what you say you are, you would be open to anything. I mean, if you're that concerned about um, being driven into another spiritual belief system, whatever system it is, that tells me that you're not a true free thinker. So a true free thinker talks to people who are theists, atheists, agnostic, white, black. It, it doesn't matter. Like, not, There's no such thing as category on this forum, really. Um, we try to explain the categories and make them more nuanced, but right. we need to break that. We need to get rid of these labels and stuff. Um, whether it's political, religious, any of this stuff, that's a big part of the problem. And that's why we're kind of in the position that we're in. But um, I want to get that off my mind because it was on my mind when you were mentioning this stuff. And um, you may have some response to that before we even get into the Odishas. Um, do you have any response to kind of that mini rant or whatever? Oh, man. I, 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 <laughs> brother, I, I love your thinking. I love your thinking, man. I, I really do. I love your thought process. And again, um, you know, again, when you're talking about an infinite energy, you know, and I, and I love, you know, I would say probably in the last seven to eight years, I've really been delving off into physics, astrophysics, science, and things of that nature. And that's what, that's what Ifa is. Ifa is a, in all of our African spiritual systems where, uh, at was, um, 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 Oh God, a African spiritual sciences, a sacred spiritual, sa sacred science, excuse me. They were all sacred science. It was a way of understanding, which goes back to what we talked about earlier about being a seeker, right? We're all students of the universe, right? Um, that if people ask me, what is my my main title? I'm a student. I'm always a student. You know, mm -hmm. of course I love helping people. Of course, I try to help people break down understandings of life, death the reality of where they are at that present time, because that's what we do as priests. You know, we that, that's some of the work we do as priests, right? But the main aspect is, is to always study and understand. So when you say you're an atheist, I mean, hey, I, I, I love you. I love your thought process on that, man, because again, I understand why atheists think the way that they think. <clears throat> and, it, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for Ifa, because Ifa has opened me up to really understand and be the student to understand everyone and anybody. Because again, as a priest, I get all kinds of people to come to me. I get mm -hmm. gay, lesbians. I get uh, atheists. I get people that are in all the three religions. I get I get people all different types. So it's just not one group of people. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't I'm not prejudiced. I don't put them down. My job is to when they come and they sit in front of me, even just like our conversation, is to the the universe itself and the energies that we use in terms of helping people understand where they add, it's a non prejudice, uh, it's it's a non discriminatory way of helping people understand their truth. I'm not there to try to convert anybody. I want people to understand their own truth and where they at and where they fit in in the scheme of life. Which goes back to what we said earlier, which is about bringing all the scrapings of the earth together so that you can create your ultimate truth, your ultimate reality. But again. I I I I understand why people call you would say they're atheists because you know some people might call me an atheist because I don't use the word, <laughs> word use the word G O D. <laughs> you know, they might say, Oh, he's an atheist. He don't believe in God. No, I don't believe in God the way you want me to believe in God. Exactly. Or you don't I don't believe in God the way that you think it because just like when you were talking about um you said something earlier about 1441. Um, um, about certain terms and certain oh, terminology. the new world you know. basically like creating black and white these categories. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with the God concept. I did some research and, and come to find out that's an English term, God, mm -hmm. and that wasn't even used until like the 7th to 8th century, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody was pretty much calling this energy their cultural names from the areas that they were in, right? Mm -hmm. But when we go back to your question again about the cosmology and we're looking at <clears throat> the, these the cosmology in, in the African concept, but even the indigenous concepts around the world was really understanding how do we keep things in balance? Think about it. Because from this invisible em, uh, emanation that we know as G-O-D or these other names that we put on it, there are emanations that come from fire, water, air, and earth. 75% of your body is made up of water. So if you don't have that water in your body, you can't live. Mm -hmm. Think about the air that you breathe. If you don't breathe that air every day, or if you close your nose with the next three to four seconds, guess what's going to happen? You're going to pass out and you're going to die. So you need that air. You need that water. 
These are the emanations. These are the things that come from this invisible energy that keep us alive every day. Um, mm -hmm. Fire. What kind of fire is burning in you every day to help you overcome those things in life, right? Um, earth. We're all made up of the different neutrons, protons, all the different chemicals and all the different elements of the earth, you know? Same stuff that's made up of us is in the stars and as up in the uh, moon, sun, and the stars, right? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is, and I'm going to say this too, is that Every planet that they go to, what do they look for when they're trying to discover something? Water. Exactly. Water is that elemental life of all things. Because if they find water, you already know there's something living there, right? Mm -hmm. It goes back to the same thing with us. You know, that as we begin to break away from these concepts, these theological and cultural concepts, what happens is we begin to see a bigger picture. So an atheist would say, you know what? I don't believe in what you all are saying and and that's okay. That's that's okay to believe that way. I just don't believe it in the way that you believe in it. Mm -hmm. And I may not even think of it the way that anybody else is thinking of it. But mm -hmm. I have my own way of thinking about it. And I love that because that's free thinking. It goes back to your form. It's free thinking. That's spiritual liberation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's spiritual liberation. I always tell people all the time, as long as you're bringing good to the earth, you're helping people, you're making the earth better you helping to elevate because there's another uh spiritual concept that says that every time you elevate yourself you elevate the earth okay or you elevating things around you so if you're helping elevate things you're helping people out you're doing the basic things about bringing love reciprocity do i really care about what you are what you are or do I really <laughs> care about what title you carry i really don't mm -hmm. i'm more concerned about the example we get to take mm -hmm. it one step further jesus never even called himself a christian a lot of them icons never call themselves anything. Mm -hmm. They were more concerned about doing the work. They weren't concerned about the title itself that, oh, I got to be a Christian or I got to be this or I got to be that. No, it wasn't about that. They were more concerned about doing the work. It's the people that are caught up on the concept. Oh, I'm such and such. And mm -hmm. they defend it. They have to defend it. This is where, you know, it becomes very disastrous. This is where, you know, it becomes very crucial because now you're defending someone else's philosophy and ideas that you really don't have a it's, it's called belief system let me say that <laughs> belief systems are merely believing in something that you don't know about but you're defending it from a part of yourself that you know nothing about that's not good that's disastrous that means you have no clue you don't really understand what you are defending but you're defending someone else's way of thinking somebody else's uh, way of uh, of life Versus in understanding what is it, how you think in your way of life, that could become very disastrous. So we have to push students. And I, and I love where you're coming from in terms of the atheist of being a free thinker. We have to push people into being free thinkers. We have to push people into being seekers. We have to push people into spiritual liberation because at the end of the day, if we don't, we're going to have a planet, a planet full of people that are still living in slavery and don't even realize they're living in slavery. Oh sure. my gosh! Wow, that's man. That if if that wasn't a mic job, I don't know what it is, and I don't even like using that because people is overused. But that's just such a conclusive statement that you just said. Then, but I want let's get to this because my audience is probably thinking and that's part of the reason why I don't stream these live because I don't want to have to deal with the comments coming in. You probably get like a thousand comments, and they're like. Damn, Kiko, when are you going to show the slideshow already? And let explain. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> About all these shots and stuff. But, like, hey, we're long winded, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you want to seek the knowledge, you may have to wait a little bit longer. But um, you mentioned Audi, which is the head. What is Sha? So, so how they would break it down the Ori Sha, this is called the selective force of nature. The Ori. Sha, Ori is your head, and the the Sha, how they would break it down, are the selective forces of nature that tempers the head. Okay, because mm -hmm. you hear a lot of times in the culture where people say, "Oh, I'm Shango," or "I'm Oshun," and mm -hmm. da 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 ever. But how I've been taught from one of our brothers, a uh, very very heavy brother, and he's in our well, um, Baba Shango Dari down in Houston, um, from um, um from the Ile in Houston. He tells us that we're not the Orisha. We are ourselves. Your Ori is your Ori. The Orisha are there to help assist the Ori. Mm -hmm. They're there to assist. Now, what happens is 
a lot of times people will come and they'll get a reading and they'll find out what energies are influencing their their head, the type of person they are, because these Arisha are archetype, uh, archetypes as well too, right? And they carry similar similarities that a person may carry on their walk of life. Mm -hmm. So the Arisha are the selective forces of nature. The selective forces of nature have a way of helping you appropriate your head. In Ifa, the head is everything. If the head is not right, nothing goes right. Mm -hmm. But the Rishas like Shango, Oshun, and there's more than just, let me put you like this, educational-wise. There's 400 plus one Arisha. No doubt. Yes, we're, 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 I was going to get, you already got to it. Look at this. We're on the same page. We're on the same 400. page. It's 400 plus one, Arisha. And, what, that, and can you tell the audience, I'm going to do a, um, a slideshow and you can kind of describe. Um, I don't have, obviously, all the audience shows, like you said, 400 plus one. Why is it 400 plus one? Why is that so significant? Because of the infinite, because of the infinite aspect of what we know as creation of what we people may know it as God, right? That thing mm -hmm. is infinite. That is so infinite. So every day there's a new energy that's being born into the universe or a new energy that is being born every day so that uh, because we can't put that energy in a box. Let me just say it like that. So everything is being born every day in the universe. So that 400 plus one in Ifa, we would say sits on the right hand side of the world. Okay. Because Ifa, the way you look in Ifa and this cosmology, you got this big circle and then you got this line that goes. It's like a calabash, right? Mm -hmm. And within this calabash, you got Orun that sits at the top and you have Earth that sits at the bottom. And then you got the east, west, north, and south, right? Mm -hmm. So within this cosmology, and you look at it, um, these 400 plus one Arisha are energies that work for the good, work for the good of the universe that will help you overcome, help you understand. Those would be your ancestors. Those would be the Arisha. Those would be the Rumale. The Rumale would be the premortal spirits that were here in the early beginnings when the earth was beginning. Arisha is known as, five, is known as deified ancestors, and the ancestors themselves are energies that had lived here at one time and they have moved on. Now, when you get to the concept that we're looking at now, like Olafi, Oludamari, and Olarun, these are three aspects of the creator. And so when you look at the whole concept in Ifa in terms of Oludamari, Olarun, and Olafi, they all represent certain aspects of that energy of the creator. And what you'll find in E5 is, is that in E5, um, I, was getting, I lost my train of thought. In E5, what, you, what you'll find is, is that you'll find shrines in every aspect where you may have a shrine for Shango, you may have a shrine for Oshun, you may have a shrine for this person, but none of these entities right here have a shrine. When, now, reason that, that from from and this was a book that I read many many years ago. The reason why the Risha, this energy God doesn't have a shrine because nobody's ever seen it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever seen God. Okay, so this is considered like a trinity right here. Olarun, Olafi, Oladumari. Olafi is like that energy that represents the sun. Oladumari is a, is a perfect depiction in terms of blowing that air. Mm -hmm. Olo Dumare, Olo Dumare, Olo Rune. All of these are, are energies in terms of helping bring us into forth, um, into fruition. All these energies are about bringing us into existence. All these energies are about bringing us into who we are as beings, meaning that we carry this same energy. Just like if you would look at the word G-O-D, um, that whole encompassing energy, that all these energies are in us at one time. And just the way, and the audience is probably going to look at this. Do you see what we are saying about the decategorization aspect of all of this? Yes, sir. It's, it's just like God is a man. It's like that, the, what we're accustomed to. But here, honestly, from what I know, and you can maybe clarify this, there's really no gender association with the supreme being that you're talking about here. No, there's no gender at all, actually. Um, when you, you know, here, here's the other thing about this, and I have wanted to pull something out real quick, too. But when here, here's, the, here's the crazy thing about it. We, we personalize that energy. 
and we put pronouns on it, he mm-hmm. or she or whatever. You know, I, I get that. And I get why people may want to do that. OK, and I and I totally, totally understand it. Right. But what people fail to realize is, is that we do that because we try to have a personal connection with that energy. OK, mm-hmm. so I, I totally get that. But I wanted to just share something with you real quick, too, in terms of that breakdown. So Olafi is like the spirit of the sun. That's that that's that rays that come off the sun. Olarun is owner of the heaven, the source of creation. And when you take Olodumare or Olodumar, you're talking about the source form in the universe. I wanted to break that down so your audience would know when they see those. It's one energy. It's just one energy. That's all it is. It's just one energy, right? Mm-hmm. But they break it down into those three aspects. Because again, too, the infinity and how infinite the, the, that um, the creator is. So I wanted to make sure. So just keep in mind, Olorun is owner of the heavens, the source of creation. Um, you got Olafi, which is the spirit of the sun. And then you also have Oludumari, which is also known as owner of Odu. Okay. And owner of Odu means that when you start dealing in Ifa, Odu are the sacred scriptures as well. That brings us communication. That brings us secret science, symbols, number, all kinds of different things, stories that go along with that as well. And it's also the source form in the universe. So I just wanted to make sure your people understood that. Because I'm always... Awesome. I, I'm always big about breaking stuff down so people know because they'll see those and say, well, what does that mean? There are three aspects of one big entity. That's all. It's uh-huh. one entity, but three aspects of that entity, if that makes any sense. So, something that um, I took, probably the biggest thing that I took from um, the course and the way something's taught to you is just as important as what you do with the information. I want to say that again, the way something is taught to you is just as important as the way you use the information. Um, the way Dr. Duke taught Santeria, again, I'm using this slide here, but I will completely understand what this is that I'm showing on the screen, even though it's from a tradition that was after the experience. It's not even, it's part of the original, but there's some things lost and some things added in because keep in mind this Santeria, when I'm teaching this to my students, this is a syncretism. This is um something that I will refer mm-hmm. to earlier as um black people having to hide their cosmology around the white religion, in this case, Catholicism in most um situations in Latin America. And Santeria wasn't even a real word in Spanish. Santo is saint in Spanish. Exactly. Uh, is literally they're hiding the orishas behind the white saints mm-hmm. because there's no such thing as a saint in uh Buru, really if you think about it, there's no such thing as a saint in um the yoruba tradition this is all christianity stuff and exactly so this is their way of hiding and making it clandestine all this was mm-hmm. clandestine because it was illegal um a lot of this practice it's it's a lot different now. I don't want to um, be hy- hyperbolic about it, but as recent as the seventies and the eighties, um, there there was serious persecution towards people who practiced any Afro cosmology in Latin America, even in black majority countries like Brazil. Mm-hmm. Um, people would have to hide, and the police would basically break up the temples. They would invade the temples. They would go in and and basically search for things in the temple yes, sir. stuff. Yes, sir. Not even letting people practice their own mm-hmm. like spirituality. This is like current time stuff. So um, not only the Hollywood representation stuff in the United States, where we have even less exposure to, to IFA, but in Latin America, where there's a broader knowledge base of IFA, which, like I said, it can be symphony in Cuba, um, depending on where you are, Captain Lumele in Brazil, they practice symphony also in Venezuela as well. Um, it's it's still something that's being attacked b- it, because it's not part of the predominant thought process, which in this case, a language would be Spanish in that part of the world, Portuguese, English here. is the, the religious and spirituality aspect is viewed the same way. Christianity is still used to control the mind as far as politics and everything else. And our stuff, is pushed to the side. And so it's our job to bring that stuff to the surface, 
to where it's um honestly it needs to be like it needs to be the way honestly I, but I we know that that's not the situation we know that we're combating other forces um of colonization is really just modern colonization and um and the testament to that is um the programming of people to not want to um, follow as afro cosmology for people not to pursue other language interests for people not to pursue different cultural interests they want to keep you in one thought process and so i think that's important to kind of bring up in this conversation because um this is all about mind control at the end of the day and we're trying to combat mind control we're trying to give people um a liberated mind so that they can you know find their own happiness they don't have to rely on happiness through um, a family member because of something that they learned or whatever. Sure, they learned something, but that's not your experience necessarily. You have to learn it your way. And um, I think I w would agree with, you know, most of what I said anyway. Oh, definitely. And I was going to say that, you know, for the audience, and this would be like another conversation for us to have another time, <laughs> but even if they go back and study the the history of Brazil and they study King Zubi and the, and the uh, Palmero. You know, if they go back and study that, that whole piece right there, man, how they had to fight, man, to get their independence, you know, to have the freedom to be able to want to do. You know, every, any anytime you go into um, any of these particular areas, you know, South America, um, even the West Indies uh, with the Maroons and, and people like that, where, you know, these people were indigenous people who is in these areas or slaves who were brought to the areas who had to fight against the people that were trying to slave or enslave that area. So no, you brought up a good point. And that's what made me think about when you were saying that made me think about King Zumi and uh and the Quilombos, you know, how they fought against those, you know, those um conquistadors and they fought against those people that were trying to keep them from practicing all those things. And it's a good movie too. So for the audience that's out there, if you get a chance, go and study um King Zumbi and and look at the uh, the Quilombos, I think you'll find very good information on that in terms of how they use <laughs> those orishas and how they use that 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 energy to overcome the situation they're in that time in uh south america oh my gosh you mentioned zumbidos pamadas zumbidos pamadas um i'm going to link all this stuff in the episode description as much as i can i'm going to link my dissertation in the episode description for this particular episode too because my third chapter of my dissertation specifically addresses zumbidos pamadas and so if you all want to learn more about that um, I have the knowledge base. This is kind of my wheelhouse when you talk about Zumbidos Palmares being the last king of Palmares, mm. uh, Quilombos being a settlement where um, people fled the persecution. And it wasn't it wasn't all black people. There may be indigenous people there as well um, to the area, Amiri Indian indigenous. And um, even whites would also go to these Quilombos, but they're predominantly black. Um, settlements um, in Brazil they call quilombos in the Caribbean they may be called maroons in Spanish speaking countries they call palinques um, and they're still there they're, um, they, a lot of them are preserved um, mm -hmm. there have been fights within the government to try to take the land from the people who have had to claim the originality to the land um, yep. so it's a legal thing in Brazil they call quilombolas quilombolas are the actual inhabitants of these places called Quilombos. And um, Zubidos Palmares was the last king of Palmares. Um, he's basically bit, become like a mythicized um, character. He's part of a broader philosophy called Quilombismo, which was um, a philosophy by the late um, Abdias do Nascimento, who was a philosopher in Brazil, Afro-Brazilian philosopher, playwright. Um, and he wrote a very important um, theater piece in 1951 called Sortilegio, Sorcery, mm. Um, mm. Sorcery B Black Mystery. It was censored for six years and it was actually published in 57. And then he published a second uh, Sortilegio in 1979 called Sortilegio Dois O Retorno do Zumbi, The Return of Zumbi, Zumbi's Return. Mm. So this is completely my wheelhouse when you talk about and that's what I mean. This is what's so beautiful about this. We have a priest here. We have an Ifa priest talking with me here. And I didn't even know that I had a connection with that way back when. And it's like I'm teaching this stuff to my students. 
But just doing this conversation, the context means so much more now, understanding that I didn't even know what I was teaching necessarily because I didn't have that connection the same way as Iowa has the connection. You know, it's just, I think that's an intriguing piece to all of this. Yeah. You know, as, as I'm going to tell you, as, as, as priests, you know, a lot of people think, you know, we do all the, you know, all the, the, the rituals and all the work, but our job is to study too. I'll be honest with you, um, brother Kiko, our job is to study and do research. Uh, my godparents were very, very fanat were emphatic about that. They said, look, you know, you become a priest. It ain't just about going out there, saving people and doing all the fluffy stuff. No, you got to study too. So I think what a lot of people don't understand being in the priesthood, it takes a lot of work. It's just not about, you know, people coming to get readings or, you know, uh, spiritual readings or, you know, people coming to get spiritual baths and we initiate them as well, too. It's really the stuff that you just talked about. And that's the kind of that's the kind of great teachers I've had over the years is that they push you to educate yourself on every level when it comes to what you get into. And I tell people this all the time before you get into some study the history because you may not want to get into it or study it because it may require more work than what you think and so that's been the journey for me as a priest is that we're pushed to constantly study and and, and brother kiko every day i'm picking up something i'm looking at something i'm studying something there's not a day i'm not studying something about spirituality as a whole african spirituality spirituality around the world um science philosophy i'm studying every day because you have to you you have to keep yourself abreast with these studies so now i just wanted to throw that out there because i i love where you were coming from in terms of breaking down the whole thing about the columbos and i and i appreciate that because a lot of our people don't understand that we only got these spiritual system because people fought for it mm -hmm. period it's resistance. Uh, exactly we didn't we didn't get this stuff did not come easy this stuff is just not laying our hands and all of a sudden you know no, it, it came it came with a lot of hard work. It came with fighting other people because they didn't want us to be who we are. And again, anytime you make a slave, they also call it the seasoning process. To season the slave, I got to take everything away from you so that you just completely submit to me and me only. And I take everything away so that you can be what I need you to be going forward. So I appreciate you bringing up that point, brother. Oh, no problem. Absolutely. Um we're going to keep going with this. Um, and again, a lot of this is in Spanish because I'm teaching in a Spanish class. A lot of times I'm introducing this stuff to students um, at a, at a basic, a more basic level. But um, I'm going to kind of just let I will keep going. And I'm going to ask questions as well that may not be related to the Orisha mm -hmm. that's on the screen. But I definitely want like a brief description of each Orisha that I show, like if you wouldn't mind. Um, sure. That's what I know is super important. And again, this is through Santeria when I'm teaching the students, but Ifa, the way Dr. Duke explained it, she equated it with Santeria on purpose. She knew what she was doing because she knows that Santeria wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Ifa. Like that's where it's really coming from. That's right. the Yoruba land, the motherland um, in Nigeria. And Santeria comes from that. Mm -hmm. um, and even, and honestly, a lot of people in Latin America would practice Santeria with their Christianity, their Catholicism or whatever it may be. Um, so th that's not unheard of. That's very common actually. In Latin America. But the legua, like what exactly is a legua as far as what he shows? A legua. My fray phone, Eshu. We also know him as Eshu as well too. Eshu, his, okay. And his name is E-S-U. Also known him as a legua. But Eshu is known as the divine messenger in Ifa. Um, anytime people are doing prayers, communication, um, all that that, that that deals with communication or putting things out or speaking things out, that's Eshu. Eshu is also known as the father of the crossroads because we know communication hits all four aspects, north, east, south, and west. So every time you get to a crossroad, you know you're right there with Eshu. The main component is being that messenger. Some people will say Eshu is the trickster, right? Now, the reason they may call him the trickster is just because Eshu has a way of bringing you to reality of where you're at in life, right? So Eshu would do certain things to bring you to this reality of who you are, what you are, 
And again, people would say, oh, he's known as the trickster, but he's also known of bringing you to a true reality of who you are and what you are. But everybody will petition to Allegra to petition those prayers, words, or anything they want to. So he governs communication. And the last part about Eshu is, is that um, he's also known as a warrior, too, because Eshu will fight on your behalf certain things that you need to take care of. He comes with a group known as, you in, in the Spanish, they will call him the Guerreros, okay? Mm -hmm. But he's also known, um, we, we call him the, um, oh, God, I uh, lost my train of thought again with the word, um, the I, the Ajagun, A-J-A-G-U-N, Ajagun. Mm -hmm. And he's, they're known as the Ajagun, the fights on the behalf of people every day for negativity and things that are not for the greatest and highest good. So Eshu is one. <laughs> I see you, brother. I see you. And uh, so, yeah, Eshu is known as one of those main warriors as well, too, but primarily known as the the, um, the communicator of divine spirit. Oh, that's amazing. So let me get a clarification. So when I met Elegua is on the screen here, but are you saying that they're the same Orisha or, um, yeah. within Ifa? Yeah, Eshu he just, and Elegua? Right, just known as Eshu. Yes, sir. Same Marisha. Wow. See, mm -hmm. and there's a difference too. That's what there's some idiosyncrasies within um the diasporic experience because I know in Cuba they may emphasize things differently. In Brazil, right. they may emphasize or certain Orishas in a different way. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep in mind there's a micro geographic component to this too, to where it's not practiced the same everywhere. Even exactly. within the same um, Santeria, Vodou, Candomblé, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Eshu, it, so let me just say this real quick for your audience as well, too. Um, the Rishas are known to have many roles, many roles. Rishas, when you think about it, if I come from this emanation of, if I come from this emanation of this divine energy known as G-O-D, um, that does not have a name and it's so infinite. The Rishas are the same way. The Rishas are infinite, you know, so they have many roles. So they'll have the name of Eshu, but they also might have other definitions to their roles as well. Oshu, Eshu Odara, uh, Eshu Okoboro. You know, these are just the name of you to just give you an example of how many names that they can have. And they all have specific meanings in terms of the energies that they deal with on a daily basis in the universe or to people as a whole. And that's a that depth. There you go. Sense. I didn't even understand why I had a shoe right next to that, the point before Elegua here, mm -hmm. and then I have a shoe right here. So that totally makes sense. Um, yes, sir. But like I said, when I'm teaching my students, I definitely tell them, hey, I'm going to tell you from the beginning, I'm a novice at this. This is just opening your mind to something completely different that you're never going to learn because, because you've been confined to the walls of East Tennessee. <laughs> and then because I'm like, you know, you fuckers aren't studying anything like this. You know, you probably learn the complete opposite, like in a negative way. But the way um, I sort of teach it is um, let's not let's demystify all this Hollywood production crap that we're mm -hmm. used to. And when you come in the classroom and you see this, it's like you can see their eyes light up like the white mm -hmm. students, the black students, like it affects everyone. So like positively like you can right. see the positivity I, I had one instance of a student being like openly kind of combative about it um it was a it was a woman and she was originally from miami she was a mm. white woman from miami and she was all she had was negative things to say about santeria negative things to say about voodoo uh, i don't know if she had a negative experience with it or what i don't mm -hmm. know what it was but i told her i was like it's my job to to teach cultural aspects of the course. It says in the syllabus, a third of your course is based on culture. This is culture. You can accept it or not accept it. This is a part of the Latin American experience, a broader part of the Black diasporic experience, and even broader than that, this is history. This right. is world history that we're teaching, basically, in a Spanish class, and mm -hmm. this affects these countries. Like, So you would agree that this is a part of the experience, right? And she mm -hmm. had to agree because it is. I'm not trying to indoctrinate you. I'm simply giving you information. You can do what you want to do with the information. Right. And I don't know why people come in with that approach, but I shouldn't say that because I understand why people come in with that approach. 
but it's our job to facilitate the process and make it um maybe harmonious isn't the word that I'm looking for, but make it understand, um, make it understand enough for them to accept it, I guess. Um, and understand that we're not trying to program them, we're simply giving them information and that that thought process that you're coming in with is a, is evidence of the programming that we're trying to demystify and deprogram. Exactly. And, you know, it's interesting that you say that because every, every, there's not one spiritual system or religion on the planet earth that did not have bad and good times. Uh, people try to take people try to take one one situation and make it worse. But I mean, like I tell people all the time, especially Christians, and I'm not singling them out because I love my Christian brothers and sisters too. But um, I say all the time, don't come preaching to folks and don't come beating people over the head when Christianity had one of the worst histories in the world of enslaving people and beating people down mm -hmm. and, and 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 force them to think in a way it was all about. Uh, what's the new world order? It was all about putting people into the way that they want them to think and just capturing and and the uh, and the uh, uh, benefits of other people so they could control certain things. I'm trying to say that in the right way. And so when we look at religions, we got to you know like, and I'm glad you brought that point up because we have to be careful. Everybody want to cr criticize another religion or they want to say this, mm -hmm. and I tell people all the time, you need to check yourself. You need to check your history because. We can start with the Ku Klux Klan and go all the way back to the to the to the Roman Catholic Church and talk about this stuff. You know what I'm saying? We can go back thousands of years and talk about how you want to put something down. And 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 what it really what it really um what it really falls down to is this is just that you're gonna have good people and you're gonna have bad people. If the people have good character, they're gonna use the religion for the or that spiritual system for the right ways. If you got a bad person, of course, they're gonna try and do all kind of crazy things with it. And we've and we've seen that. So I definitely get your point. You're always gonna have those few people who's gonna try to come in and throw throw sour stuff at it and, and really don't even understand, you know, the reason why certain things may have happened. But you can't say that the whole religion, I mean, excuse me, the whole spiritual system is bad because mm -hmm. of one incident or one aspect. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that was just so much you said there, but um, we'll definitely have to have you back on at a later time. But um, I just want to say, do you have about 45 more minutes? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I'm okay. with you. Okay. I'm with you. We're going to get through these Orishas. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Ogun. Ogun. My yes. fray phone, Ogun. My fray phone, Ogun. I give honor and praise to Ogun. So Ogun is an energy that deals with removing obstacles out of the way. Uh, he stands on truth. And as you can see his sword right there, that's a very important aspect because he uses that sword to cut the cord, to cut the energies and remove things out of the way. So Ogun energy is about moving civilizations. It's about taking things to a higher level. Um, there's an energy with Ogun. There's an Odu in Ifa with Ogun that, that says, Anything that's pulling you away from the home is pulling you away from your destiny. So Ogun is about removing obstacles out of your way so that you can be in alignment with your destiny. And he's also about bringing you the truth to where you are. Ogun also deals with technology and about building civilizations, a building community. So Ogun is a very, and he's also part of that warrior energy as well, the Ajagun as well. Uh, Ajagun spelled A-J-O-G-U-N? A J A G U N is okay, the A J A G U N. And, and then, what is um Egungun? The Egungun are the ancestors. That's what we can consider to be the collective realm of ancestors. Okay. Awesome. Oh yeah. My fray fun oh yeah. My fray fun oh yeah. My fray fun oh yeah. Oh yeah is known as she's a female warrior, but she is fierce. She is known as the wind. Okay. So when you feel that wind blowing outside, boom, she's knocking things down or she's bringing things. She can be calm and balanced just like Oshun or water. You know, waters can be real calm and cool, but they can also get wavy too. Oya's energy to wind is the same way. Wind can be real calm, but it can knock you down. Oya is known as the mother of the marketplace. She deals with progression. She also is known as the mother over the cemeteries and the ancestors as well too. So she's a very, 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 very powerful um, Arisha in terms of anytime you want to handle your business, this would be a good, good energy to go to in terms of handling your business, as well as making communication with your ancestors. And like I said, her energy is all about progression, but she's a beautiful energy because she also deals with radical change as well.
And like I said, I don't know if it's from the way I introduced, I was introduced to these Orishas, but at least within Santeria, and I may be completely wrong, if people in the comment section, if, if you know more about or you have a different experience about this, let me know. But from my experience, Oya was not emphasized the same way as Iyamaya and Oshun, for instance, um, at, at least in the literature. I don't mm -hmm. know why that is, mm -hmm. but um, we know that in Ifa, Ifa itself, there's going to be transitions when this is brought across the Atlantic Ocean. We have to keep this aspect in mind that mm -hmm. diasporic aspect of this is still affecting, I wouldn't say interpretations of Ifa, but maybe realizations of Ifa or the way it's executed. Because mm -hmm. these Orishas are being executed differently within the literature. Um, and I'm a literature specialist. That's what I do is literature stuff. Mm -hmm. So from my interpretation, Oya is not... Um, given the same kind of credit as maybe some of the other feminine um orishas or whatever and that was an observation i made it may mm -hmm. be a miscalculated observation but i'm basing this on literature strictly so don't come at me too hard because i'm not <laughs> saying that oya is not no. as yamaya or i'm not talking about you I, I, i'm just saying in general because i know people on the internet you never know what they're going to come at you oh with. man they <laughs> <laughs> right. And what they have to understand, too, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier, Brother Kiko, is that um, anytime people get their hands on this information, they're going to put their cultural stuff into it. So it's a good possibility that Oya did not get the same connotations or the same energy as a, as a uh, Oshun or a Yemaya, you know, because she is very fierce. She's a female warrior. Um, and what's interesting is Oya, Oshun, and Yemaya were all rivers. So even though they look at Yamaya as being the ocean, uh, she was part of a river. Oshun was part of a river. Oya was also part of a river, too. I thought, I, I, when I did my research, I thought that very interesting. Very, very interesting. But, you know, as time goes on, they take on, you know, they, they always had to originate. Like I said, Oya's always had the energy of the wind, always the energy of handling the ancestors, always the energy of progression and being the mother of the marketplace and radical change. But she's a fierce, fierce fem feminine warrior. She don't play. She don't play at all. And from my understanding, these Orishas have relationships with each other. Wasn't Oya a wife of Shango? Man, you oh, that's the other part about this. <laughs> You're gonna hear all the different stories about how they were, yeah, that is true. How they have how they were connected in marriage, man. Um how they had, you know, different uh, relationships with each other, you know, from, I mean, all of them had these different relationships, uh -huh. right? But again, too, you know, you go into mythology, you go into the, the cultural, like, like you said, you know, um, in the writing aspect of this all, you know, you're going to find multiple stories about many, many different things, you know, um, just like not too long ago when I was looking at the Rumala, uh, Rumala was a wrestler, you know, mm -hmm. I'm looking at some stories where Rumla was a wrestler, man. So that's why when they call about when someone is divining and he, and they're throwing to the mat, it's because of how he was a wrestler back in the day. In short, there's a longer story to that. But yeah, but yeah, you're going to find a multiple stories about these Orishas and their connections <laughs> with each other. Yes, sir. We'll go through some of these and um, I shouldn't have too many more on here. But yeah, these are just the ones that um, and like I said, through the literature, Obviously, I placed these on the slideshow based on I, priority, I guess is the right word. But this is, again, mm -hmm. based on my lit background and what is being written on. And this is just kind of what I'm getting from. Because, again, 400 plus one, right. I mean, you don't have enough time in the day to explain every single right. function. And, you know, the plus one is super important because it is infinite. You know, in case there's something that's lost, something is gained, it goes back to the the law of conservation of energy. That's yes, the science aspect can't really be separated from the spiritual aspect. And um, we're actually going to have my friend Ben come on to also give a different perspective about how you can't separate spirituality from science. Um, yeah, you know, which has been you know done a lot, obviously for mm -hmm. different reasons. But um, a Shoshi is a Chosi. A a Chosi. Yeah, Chosi is the spirit tracker, and he's known for his trajectory and keeping things on point. So Chosi, 
one of his main implements is the bow and arrow. He's also part of that um, the warrior aspect as well, too, part of that Ajah Goon. So you, in that Ajah Goon, you have Ochosi, Ogun, Eshu, and um, um, Osun. There's another energy there. It's called Osun. Almost spelled like Oshun, O-S-U-N. Um, and Osun deals with the balance, the temperament of the Ori, keeping the Ori together, just like Obatsala. Obatsala does the same thing. Uh-huh. But Ochosi is known as the spirit tracker, meaning keeping things on trajectory, keeping things on point, keeping things on target. And most of these Orishas, especially once you just show Eshu, Ogun, and Ochosi, their primary area are the forest, or when you walk into a forest element, that's when you are walking into that element. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Olokun, Olokun, interesting. So the ocean, um, you hear a lot of times that the ocean is, is comprised of two parts. Yemaya at the top, Olokun at the bottom. Olokun represents the bottom of the ocean or represents an aspect of the ocean of the unknown. Um, there's stories where you hear about Arumala going down to the bottom of the ocean, spending time with Olokun because again, Arumala, which is dealing with uh, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, um, being one of the head of Rishas when it comes to that. But Olokun is an energy that lives at the bottom of the ocean of the unknown because you can't go that far down to the bottom of the ocean without exploding or going up. So Olokun deals with the energy at the bottom of the ocean. So what you may see with Olokun, some people um, bring it to a male aspect or female aspect. Um, so what's interesting is because we know that water itself is like an amniotic fluid, like in the womb itself, when a woman is having a baby. So you're going to hear those arguments about is male is female. To me, um, all the reaches can have a male and female aspect and that's just anything in, in nature itself. You feel what I'm saying? Because, you know, you can't come out, you can't come into the universe without coming throughout the womb first. You know, universe is a, is a cosmic womb itself. So, we come out of women. So, yes, they can both carry some of those aspects. But Olokun, to me, would be more of the feminine than it would be the masculine. But you might give a different different opinion that it may just also be uh, male, too. But I think they can carry both, both aspects, in my opinion. I was always taught in my program and just through the literature, Olokun is depicted as androgynous. Exactly. Exactly. And you're going to find that most most some of those Orishas are androgynous. So Batala, you hear that Batala has an androgynous side as well, too. But that's just, if you think about it, that's just nature itself. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? That's just the universe. When you think about it, look, think about us. We have a feminine side and a masculine side. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a feminine side because you come from a woman. Of course, we're going to come out as men. And same thing with women. Women are going to come out. They're going to have the feminine, but they also got that masculine side as well. So what Ifa also teaches us that we all both have those masculine and feminine side. How do we keep them in balance? Now, some of us may work from some of them more than others, and there's nothing else to set away with that either. But the Rishas helps us understand how we work with those energies. Because again, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm all man, but I'm Oshun at the core. Um, <laughs> Oshun is, is what heads my life, but I function more from a feminine side in terms of my nurturing and caring. That doesn't mean I don't know how to work and get down and get dirty, get my hands dirty, and don't know how to do all this. St- yeah, believe me, I, I'm, I've i been doing that my whole life. You know, I come from a, a father <laughs> that made your knuckles bleed, but my, my energy is about love, affection, and caring for people, so Oshun definitely is the aspect that I function from. But it's the same thing with Olokun as well. You can function from either one of those sides. And um, another word that we didn't talk about before when um, associated with free thinker is humanist, which is a very loaded <clears throat> word. And I like to consider myself a humanist because um, I always throw these questions, you know, teaching cultural aspects of what is a man, what is a woman. These are all constructions. Uh, what is a man? What's a woman? They're all constructions at the end of the day. There's no one definition all the time. And mm-hmm. things aren't meant to stay the same forever. Um, and that's why I try to teach people. That's why I love this um, Odisha in particular is because I think you can take a lot from it as far as um, maybe not versatility. Maybe that's not the word I'm looking for, but just being able to adapt the adaptability of your own personal characteristics, your personality, like everything is not 
supposed to be like people get are going to have emotions. Mm -hmm. um, I was telling my son last week, um, he hang out with his boys a lot. And I'm like, y'all be talking about people all the time, don't you? Like, because people always say, oh, the girls like the gossip at the slumber parties. I'm like, bullshit. The, the men are talking just as much as the women, if not more. Right. Um, <laughs> I right. don't know why people get caught up in these um, categories and stuff. Trust me, everyone is talking. Everyone has feelings. Everyone has emotions. Yes, sir. And don't let people say that, oh, this is what a man does. This is what a woman does. No, nah, it's, it's just everyone's different. And um, at some point, you're probably going to have an intersection of both of them. Arumila. Arumila. Abarobo Yobo. Cishe. Arumila Alair E. P. E. B. K. G. Olo Damar E. B. E. Chanu. Arumila is known as the witness of fate, meaning that he was there at the beginning of the time, the beginning of the day of dawn, where he saw all things coming to fruition. That's one of Arumila's energies. Arumila's uh, main name to Orun because you can see heaven in there Orun which is heaven in his name Orumila Orumila means heaven no salvation and Orumila is the reach of knowledge wisdom and understanding so Orumila was kind of like the one who had the 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 um what's the word uh, the tempered head for all things right because Arumala was known to bring all the science and the secrets to, to the forefront. So people who went to go get a divination that sit in front of Arumala is getting the secret science of the universe. They're getting the codes. They're getting the messages. They're getting many, many different things. Arumala in his story um, had many different titles. Um, he had teacher, priest, king. Uh, he had a, a plethora of different titles and different, different types of um, ways of life. Um, there's even stories about how with Arumala when um, his children, and you're going to hear it in many different ways, because that's the one thing about literature, you're always going to hear it in many different ways, mm -hmm. about how he retreated to, to heaven um, because um, how he was disrespected uh, by his children and people around him. And uh, he ended up retreating in heaven. And said, well, from now on, if you all want to communicate with me, you got to divine with me. So he gave them implements to where they had to communicate with him on that level um, because they really, really had made him bad, really had made him mad. But he has a beautiful story in terms of uh, being one of the head head um, energies that's going to help you understand your path and mission in life. Um. If if you're speaking to a Christian in the audience, for instance, um, would you say that there's a connection between um, some of um, that thought process? Would they be able to relate to some of these Orishas, in your opinion? I think that oh. they're very relatable. Would you say so? Oh, no doubt about it. Matter of fact, um, when you think about um, in the Christian concept, when you take Jesus, Jesus would be a good representation of um, of Haru and Kemet and Shango, right? Um, some of those energies, as well as Obatala, you know, because you think about the all white, you think about Jesus coming with the peaceful, the calmness, the coolness, right? That's Obatala. But if you're talking about the truth, then that would be Shango and Haru. And we know that this Jesus story was taken from Haru out of Kemet, right? But, uh, but when you make the comparisons, Haru and Shango had the same time. I mean, excuse me, Haru and uh, Jesus had the same story and you have a, a shango element that's tied to it so that's how we're breaking down to our christian brothers and sisters and obatala will have that calm cool energy you know bringing about that way of spirituality in a very very high form as well too now obatala obatala now his name is king in the white cloth and obatala places are like high high places like hills and mountains and his energy is really about patience balance keeping things in order um and looking at spirituality from a very 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 high level but obatala is a very 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 beautiful energy and he kind of reminds you of that old wisdom you know some of his symbols are the cane the staff and things of that nature where you know he's walking around a very very slow calm cool collective but obatala can also be a warrior too um, there's stories about um that um because he's so calm that if you make him mad, he scares all the reaches away. Because that's just, you know, you know, the, the ones that you make mad all the time. You know, you make somebody mad sometimes, mm -hmm. and it'd be the and it'd be the one who's so quiet and don't 
you know, don't get into trouble, don't do nothing. But then the ones you don't want to make mad, because when you do make a mad, they're about to turn everything out. So that's one of the stories of Obatala as well, too, that um, he has such a peaceful and loving energy. But when he is tempted to go to that place, you got to watch out because he'll come in and just he'll he'll take everything out. Something you said, what was what were you coming on earlier when you talked about Jesus and, and commit and commit? You were saying something about the Jesus story. Like, what do you mean by that? What were you saying? So so when you look at the story of Haru um, and Kemet, right, because in Kemet, you had Usair, Aset and Haru. Those were the African names. You might know them by the Greek names of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Okay. Mm -hmm. This story of Jesus was duplicated from that story many, many thousands of years before uh, he was even born. Um, you had this trinity that took place in Kemet many, many thousand years ago. So when you go and you do your research, you'll even also see the comparisons that, you know, Haru uh, was born to two mothers, uh, Neptus and Isis. Jesus was born to two mothers, Mary and Cleophas. Um, Haru ended up leaving at the age of 12. Uh, Jesus ended up leaving at the age of 12. <laughs> yeah. Um, Haru was baptized by Neptus and um, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, and they have similar stories, but they took the story and replicated it from the Haru story. I mean, even the whole story about, you know, evil as well, you know, um, you know, where you got Usair, who was who was the king of Egypt, uh, fighting against his brother Set, who represented evil and, um, you know, conspired to kill his brother, chopped him up to the many different pieces. And then his wife, you know, Isis, as we also known as Offset, went to go find all his pieces and remember the body and then had this resurrection of um, Haru coming to life. Right. Haru comes back through the resurrection of her mother by having. Um, this this conception with um, her, um, Usair after he passes away, and now they have this child that's coming in, this God child, Haru. Haru comes back to avenge the father, to avenge the death of his father, which is set. So you find that story all the time in, in Christianity about them fighting over the different things like that in some of his literature as well. But you can compare those stories and look at it and say, damn, I can see how they took the story from Kemet because, again, this was about a resurrection. This was about overcoming evil, um, fighting the negativities of the world. And it was an immaculate conception there as well, too. And then and I think his name was uh, Kersey, uh, Dr. Kersey. He wrote a book called The 12, the 12 Different Saviors Across the World, because in each culture around the world, you'll find that they always had these type of savior stories. Um, you know, the virgin mother, then you had this 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 child that was born out of a virgin birth, mm -hmm. immaculate conception, and then comes back to save that particular area of the world. You'll find that all over the world. But yeah, I just wanted to share that with you, that comedic story, because that that was definitely a story that we know that was definitely duplicated from Egypt. And something too you mentioned earlier made me think of the reformalization of Christianity. Because um, it's interesting around the holidays and stuff, the, the quote unquote, the holidays. Um, my mom was like, what does Easter have to do with the bunny and the egg? And I actually explained, I explained that story like to my, my uncle and my mom. And I had them floored. And like I gave them just like a brief explanation. I was like, well, think about the expression of rabbits. Like what do rabbits do a lot? Right. You know? And then you think about like the egg, you're like what does the egg represent? Mm -hmm. You know, you think of birth, you think of maternity, right? You think yes, of sir. Multiplication, and so, and you're like, but how does that have to do? Like, what what does that come from, or whatever? What well, Christianity has always like, like you were being very nice about it too, and I'm being nice about it too, trying to explain because I definitely I'm not in the business of offending people. But Christianity has a very brutal history. Oh, man. <laughs> and and as a result of that brutal history, you don't just have all these holidays out of innocence. These are right. holidays of aggression, mm -hmm. the holidays of, of massacres, honestly. Yes, um, sir. If you really dig into the history, you know, whether it right. was, um, you know, those um, Germanic tribes in Europe that were indigenous to that area or whoever it may be. Um, someone suffered, you know, that story suffered and we have a different kind of story now, but that wasn't mm -hmm. the story that was originally there. 
And that that's why people are like, okay, Christmas, you have a Christmas tree, Easter, you have an Easter right. bug. And it confuses people, but if you dig down deeper, you realize where a lot of this stuff um, transitions. Exactly. I've even heard another story, too. I heard um, Brother Ashra Kwesi talk about this, too. That one of the stories was, too, about Easter was that um, what they would do is <clears throat> they would make the women run into the into the woods and then they would end up going and the men would go into the woods and follow them and then, you know, have babies with them, have sex. Mm -hmm. This was also another part of the Easter concept as well, too. There's a lot of men. That's why I say people need to go back and really look at these holidays and understand it as well as the comedic story, too, around, you know, Christmas. That wasn't really an, an origination of of, um, of Christianity. But if the audience, you know, I would like to let the audience know if you all get a chance, please go out there and study the history of Kemet and how he had to deal with the 25th of December because it had nothing to do with the S-O-N. It had to deal with the S-U-N and oh, how wow. the day. Yeah. And how the days um, ended up becoming, you know, how they got um, shorter and longer and how the earth gets on the axis and it stays still for a certain amount of time for, I think, three to four days during that time period. And then how the S-U-N plays the most important part in this story. So that's how they got this story. And then how everything is, is based upon the solar system and the constellations in terms of um, uh, uh, the Sirius system. So, yes, I would I would definitely encourage this audience to go and study that as well, the 25th of December, and how it wasn't about someone being born in a manger, because that story was corroborated as well, too, because there's stories about Jesus also being born in a cave in Ethiopia. So you may want to go back and study those stories a little bit more. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you just laid it out there like that. Like, you may want to go back and do some research. And um, just for the audience or whatever, if you have to replay this episode like 20 or 30 times, there's no problem with me. Um, and just tell your friends and family about Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum while you're at it. And the beautiful work that Iowa does as well. Um, because... And you, I probably should have told you, you should have had a pen and paper with you <laughs> doing this interview more than any other one, probably. No, that's a lie. Most of the interviews are pretty much like, as my wife would call them, gosh, you guys talk about all kinds of stuff, don't you? Like, yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, we'll go through a few more of these. Sure. Shango. And then I want to get into the actual, like, how do you, like, like become a priest? Like, what goes into that? Like, what goes into a ceremony? Yes, sir. And you got Sean Gohill who represents transformation. He also represents thunder and lightning, structure, structure and strategy. But Sean Go is known for being the fierce warrior as well. Um, Sean Go has many, many great stories of overcoming. Uh, Sean Go also has many great stories about strategizing as well, too. But his one of his main implements is the thunderstorm. But his energy deals with transformation, helping people really transform their energy and making it better than it was beforehand. In short. Wow. Okay. And um, I noticed a lot of these Orishas have um like warrior characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Be a common, like as you said earlier, <laughs> archetype. Yeah. The majority of them that you read about have this this warrior piece. Uh Yemaya or Yemaya, mother of the ocean, mother of the fishes. That's her name, mother of the fishes. And um, she is known to be the mother of the energy on top of the ocean. So you have Olokun, where we dealt with at the bottom, but you can see how she's at the top, mm -hmm. right? When you saw Olokun, his picture was up underneath. Mm -hmm. He was in the water. She's on top. So they say that she rules the top of the ocean, along with being the mother of the fishes. Her energy is about nurturing and bringing all things together. She represents that mother figure of all things, of bringing that energy of, of nurturing, loving, caring. Her and Oshun have a lot of the same aspects in terms of that, but her energy is just more of the ocean, salt water. Oshun is more of the fresh water, the ocean. And um, like I said, too, Yemaya, too, at one time, she was part of a river a river as well, too. Yemaya is very common in the literature in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Um Yamiya is one of the most, um, I don't want to say important, but one of the most prominent um, and more emphasized Orishas, like out of, um, Yamiya is mentioned a lot in literature. Um, now, I'm just saying from my standpoint in Latin America, and um, unfortunately, there's a there's a, a darker side 
opportunity is there's been a, a huge exploitation of um, Ifa, Santeria mm -hmm. um, in Latin America because a lot of the tourists come there and they're like intrigued. And you see people dressed up as Iamaya and all these different Odishas. And people are basically panhandling on the streets or whatever. Um, there's a very common practice in some of the touristy traps in Latin America, just um, for my audience to know. So um, don't get too Disney-fied with this because they, <laughs> I love that they, word. Will, they will have a tendency to dis Disney-fy anything, even the great things, they will disney them because they are so intriguing. I mean, I've heard so many students refer to Iamaya as their favorite Orisha mm. just as far as like a visual. Um, they think just it's, it's a beautiful association. It, it's crazy. A lot of my students, and shout out to any students that I've ever taught and will teach in the future. But, um, and if you happen to watch this video on YouTube, comment that you were one of my students before, so I know who you are, because um, I used to have them name as many Odishas as they can, and it's crazy. Some of these people would fail their test, I will, and, but they would know every single Odisha. But they would, <laughs> I'm like, y'all motherfuckers ain't learned no Spanish, but you know all the Odishas. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's funny man that's but hilarious it's like, but it's amazing how they get so caught up and and that's the point though is like it's a positive experience regardless mm -hmm. and it's not about indoctrination it's about elevation i guess that's right would be the word to use um yes sir. i'm not convincing you of anything it's simply like hey you have a completely different perspective about what you may have known about these Orishas or, but, you know, I don't know what baggage people have coming into this, mm -hmm. but that's the whole point of learning with each other is um you have a positive experience with it. It's not meant to be a negative experience. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what they're there. They just, I tell people all the time, Orishas are there to show you at both sides, the good side and your shortcoming. Mm -hmm. So if people would understand that, they would really understand the Orisha in its totality. Of course, they're there to go to show you the good things, but people get caught up on the good side and never think about that. Okay, these Orishas here also show me about my shortcomings as well. Mm -hmm. um, Oshun. Oh, my God. Oshun, Oshun, Oshun. So my friend Foon Oshun, she is known as the mother of love, reciprocity, abundance, fertility. Um, she is known as those great things. She is known as the mother of beauty. Um, Oshun is known as the mother of the river, but she is also one of the, the name. Another definition for her is she is known as the source, the source of all things. Um, she's deeply mystical. She is deeply um, um, infinite in love. She just represents beauty in a way to show people metaphysically that beauty can be shown in all things. Um, and again, her name, Oshun itself, you know, she is a, the mother of the river, but um, beautiful energy. And just like any other Risha too, she has a fierce side as well too, you know, and her fierce side is like that water that comes knocking down everything, you know, like when you see them floods and they're knocking down houses and things because all these Arishas, uh, energies they have a good side they have it but that's that's nature itself think about nature right when you think about okay forces of nature and you think about nature nature itself can get vicious on you right when you see tsunamis you see hurricanes hurricanes and tornadoes that's oh yeah right you see the tsunamis that's the ocean you know things like that right you look at a, a river when it's just knocking stuff down so what they also show us too is that the reaches are beautiful but they can also have that other side too that will also show a side of them that we don't really get to see. And that's the whole thing about the universe itself. You know, we always look at things on a good day when it's sunny and it's beautiful, but nature itself can also have days where you'd be like, I'm just going to stay in the house today. It's just too crazy today, right? But mm -hmm. when you think about it, that's who we are as people. We have that side that's good, but then we also have that side that can come out when something is triggered. But yes, she represents, and if you see right there, she got her mirror because she also represents the reflection like when you look in water mm -hmm. and you see yourself her mirror represents the reflection of looking at yourself as well uh, shout out to someone uh, I usually don't give credit to celebrities because I think most celebrities are just so full of shit and they keep everything intact and keep people brainwashed and stuff but um, sometimes you have to use celebrities to um, highlight certain points and um, 
I got the students, I get them really interested in Oshun, especially La Oshun um, in Spanish, because um, I don't know if people remember, but Beyonce actually refers to the Orishas a lot. Um, Beyonce, you know, because of her ancestry and her ties to, um, I think, New Orleans. She mm -hmm. has ties there. And in New Orleans, there's a little bit more of an elevated presence of um, Voodoo and Santeria, these aspects that may not be as readily available in some other parts of the country. But um, she dressed as Oshun at, at a ceremony at one of the award shows, I think. Mm -hmm. She dressed just like this. And yeah. I was telling the students, um, and that got that elevated a lot of their interest. Sometimes you have to use celebrities to kind of get them interested right. in these, um, you know, more deeper cultural topics. It's it's interesting because now you find a lot of celebrities dibbling dabbling in African spirituality. Now they might not, <laughs> you and they, and dabble. yeah, and they they won't come out and fully tell you, but they they do it behind closed doors. Um, there's a lot of folks, um, especially singers, actors, mm -hmm. a lot of people who are involved in Ifa, and they just keep it real, real quiet. More so than like, you know, if you look at um, music, especially like if you look at the Afro-Cuban music, you're going to find a lot of Arisha influence in that music. Um, you might even find some influence even in um, Bossa Nova, some people who were actually, you know, um, influenced with Ifa as well, too. But it's interesting because a lot of people, you know, they see the power in this stuff. And, you know, as I was always told coming up in this, is that people see the power in these Orishas and in the ancestors and Ifa itself with the rituals and things of that nature. So Ifa draws people because of his power. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, Oshun, just um, to clear things up, in literature, Oshun has a tendency to be depicted more as like a, an, an enticer, a temptress because of her beauty. Right. For whatever reason, and the Yamaya right. is Yamaya is is used more so as um. She seems to be depicted as like the mother figure, like over the other right. Orishas. Like that's the way they make right. it. At least that's what the literature does. Mm -hmm. But there's a tendency to put Oshun as like this temptress type archetype. That may yeah. not be a fair um characterization because mm -hmm. I mean she's also way more than just this minor type of. Um, pigeonholing that that is common in some of the literature, but maybe that's the literature's way of. It's the literature, yeah, yeah for it's sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the literature for sure, and then it's also the cultural stuff too, because um, Africans don't really look at Oshun like that. The African brothers and sisters don't oh, wow. depict Oshun really? as a as a whore and prostitute and all these other things, because that that's more that's more of a santeria type thing that's more of, of that type energy not to say that um what's the word i'm looking for um when i say center i'm not disrespecting them in, by any means but just saying that that's how their literature is written for her when actually in actuality i think they took the beauty and mistaken that you know because people were mistaken beauty sometimes and look at beauty as being promiscuous and it's not because she's very revered in Africa, but not with all the promiscuity and things of that nature. Um, she's viewed as a very, very high goddess, one who brings a lot of love and a lot of energy to the world. But you're right. The literature in some of these cultures will depict her as something totally different or even how they write their stories in terms of who she is. And then you have, um, for instance, um, there was a there's a white author. Um, his name was Cyril, Cyrilo. Villa Verde, a Cuban mm. writer, he wrote a novel called Cecilia Valdez. Cecilia Valdez was about a mixed race woman in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And basically, it, it's it's just this mythical whole idea. This um it's almost like this racial democracy myth bullshit that I've been debunking for years, and a lot of other people have debunked in Brazil, but they do it in Cuba too. Oh and, bad. Um, is this whole idea of like the mixed race woman being the, the mother of the country. This whole idea of mulataje is what they call it, like mulato. And this archetype, like they've mm -hmm. done this in Latin America for years. Um, in Peru, it may be the indigenous person, the Mary Indian indigenous person, where this is like the, the creation of the nation and this is like the face of the nation. Right. Like it, it, it's, it's one of those cosmovision 
type um, games that's used when they created these countries in the first place, like after these countries declared mm -hmm. independence. And Cecilia Valdez is no exception to this creation of a myth. And it's been kind of, a, I think what's happened with Oshun and Cuba, especially in some Definitely. of the literature, is that they confuse, um, they try to add like, the racial mixing component. Yes, sir. And then they combine yes, it with Santeria. They combine that with Ifa and everything else. And it definitely is, is creating a whole nother like story. Oh, no, no, no when it, doubt. When it comes to that representation. In this no case. doubt about it. And I'm sorry, brother. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. No, I finished that. Uh, no, but you good. know, it's, it's interesting because it, it really goes back to, to history and people who controls religion itself. Right. I, I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. I like my I like my black gods. I like them dark skinned. I like I like Oshun being dark skinned. I like Yemi Yaw being dark skinned. You know, I'm light skinned, but I my you know, half of my family's dark skinned. You know, I got <laughs> on my daddy said everybody's dark skinned. So I like I like I like my gods and goddesses dark skinned. You feel what I'm saying? So to me, don't take it from its original depiction of what it really is because it's a dark skinned god you know they always want to take our stuff and and just flip everything around right <laughs> and, and 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 make it now i get it because i i get it but that's not the way i see it you know what i'm saying but when you look at it it's even just like with the jesus picture let's take it to that because this is a <laughs> primary example you know the book tells you that okay jesus is a man of fiery eyes woolly hair feet burnt like brass burnt like brass you know you got to really be burning some stuff right so here it is we get a whole different depiction through our history that jesus is a white man that's crazy when your own book tells you that he's a dark-skinned man a man of color and it's the same thing with our reaches you know they are these are dark dark-skinned guy and i love it it's good to see dark-skinned gods you know what i'm saying it's good to see these beautiful Arisha with the element, the, the men, you know, the 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 the, the masculine being dark skinned, the feminine being dark skinned. That brings a lot of pride to people like ourselves who were always put down because of being called black or people not respecting us as a group of people because we were of a different hue or a different color. This gives us motivation. This gives us life to see those pictures, to see them dark-skinned women and dark-skinned brothers up in there, man, with this kind of depiction of the Orishas, right? So, again, this is just people trying to... This is what happens when things travel around the world in, in, in a very short way. When when the system goes around the world and it gets to another group of people, they may not keep it the same. Some elements may be there, but they may not keep it the same. Can you imagine if Orishas went to, if, if it went to Alaska somewhere cold, we might have a whole different, you know what I'm saying? We might have a whole different thing. But that's what happens when these, when these systems travel around the world, people begin to infuse their culture, mm -hmm. their way of thinking to it, and then it changes. So like you were saying, literature-wise, that's why you get the stories that you do. And, and it's also, it makes a difference too. And that's why... Um... It's not the only reason why I work um, primarily with Black authors. Uh, you know, me being a Black person myself, I work with Indigenous um, writers, LGBTQ of different um, right. races, everything else. It's just a matter of um, the literature, the time period is crucial because 19th century, especially in Latin America, Cuba, for instance, is probably the country I have the most familiarity with. And um, in the 19th century in Cuba, what's happening? You still slavery doesn't end in 1886 in Cuba. 1888 mm -hmm. in Brazil. Brazil was the last country in the Americas to end slavery. Wow. Um, people don't understand that. That was not that long ago. 1888. This is after the United States. <sighs> because no. the industry was so driven down there, the, the sugar cane, um, mm -hmm. um the way they worked the Amerindian Indian people in the mines, the way they worked the black people in the mines, the way they worked people on these different types of plantations, whether it's tobacco, whether mm -hmm. it's sugar cane, whether it's gold, silver, right. bauxite, whatever it is, is still the exploitation of the labor of the people. You know, the chattel slavery basically still. And um, a lot of these countries did not become quote unquote liberated to way later in the game. And, um, 
you had most at the time a lot of those countries were majority black countries a lot of people don't understand that but the writers were white majority yes sir and you can count on your hands and and this is going to really mind drop some people out of all the writing in latin america there's only been one documented autobiography of a black person, like a former slave, mm. like an autobi a autobiography telling wow. their own story. And that work is called Autobiografia de un Esclavo, Autobiography of a Slave, written by mm. a gentleman, Juan Francisco Manzano in Cuba. Wow. But he had to have a white man publish it for him because mm. he wasn't able to do it himself. I mean, I think he was mixed race, but he was still black, you know, viewed as a black person and um you know being enslaved by default mm -hmm. you know viewed as a black person in cuba and um you have that kind of stuff where there's still even in a region where most of our people were transported to there's very little literature that represents us even if you go back to per se 1825 1830 1830 i think is when this was published 1830 so you're talking about 300 years in and there's still no sort of like literary um, imprint of our, like, you know, the, our way of thinking or anything mm -hmm. that doesn't happen to honestly, Haiti would be the best example because you had the Haitian revolution in 1804. Exactly. Um, it started earlier than that started in the early 17. 90s you know the latter part of the 1780s with the struggle with the french mm -hmm. and um i've done whole episodes on this or whatever with Toussaint Louverture and um mm. Dessalines, all the different generals that um led to that first successful wow. establishment of um a black nation really honestly a uh, by former slaves which is haiti 1804 mm. um haiti is a very important equation in this whole um, cosmology, yes, sir. Um, Bodu is 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 done a lot differently because in Haiti, I will, there was definitely more. The African experience had more control of their story. They didn't have a hundred percent complete control, but they had way more control of their story than they did in Cuba per se, or in Brazil, mm -hmm. for instance. And so it's important to keep in mind that in the literature, that representation of the orishas any yep. of the the stories told within the family are going to be depicted a lot differently than they are based again geographically speaking right language speaking is going to be a different experience yes, but sir. this is all part of a broader experience mm -hmm. you brought up a very good point this is the reason why we have to control our our literature and we have to control the dynamic of the stories of our people because if we don't, they'll just say anything. And that's very important because, again, we have a, we have such a rich history about overcoming and doing great things that if we're not careful, uh, the story can look totally different. And when you're talking about groups, and, and I'm going to say this, too, especially with today's time, because I think a lot of our, 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 our younger generation, I'm not saying all, but it's very few, only cares about that. And you have a lot of people that don't care about that, but it's important to people like us, man, because if you don't get though, if you don't get that history correct, it presents like we've never done anything in history. Same thing like in, in certain with Egypt and other parts of the world where we've done many, many great things. And as well as like you were just saying now about our revolutions, you know, if you don't put these stories out there, people don't have a story to look at, to overcome and to get better. Uh, and, 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 we, we got to be real careful about this. So I totally agree with you in terms of, of, of taking control of that dynamic. Um, yes. Um, and I promise you all, we're going to get to the ceremonial aspect of this, but um, I want to touch just, just on a few Orishas left. Uh, Babalu okay. Aye. Babalu Aye, yes. Babalu Aye is known as the Orisha of his pestilence and sickness. Um, he is known that usually when something is going on with the person who is sick, uh, we usually confer to him or we tap into him in terms of helping people get better uh, with their with their um with their health and um as far as the ceremony aspect we can add this in as well um what goes into an ifa ceremony like what goes into that how long does this ceremony last and what exactly encompasses a ceremony an ifa ceremony so there's different types of ceremonies in ifa so you know um 
depending on where you go in the diaspora. So in an example, when you come to Americas or you come to any of those places in, the, in um, South America, Santa Ria, um, you can find multiple ceremonies when somebody is going through it. What we've tried to do here in this in this in this space in America, especially with the temple that I belong to, the Institute of Whole Life Healing, um, we keep it very African, but we're also very universal in our aspect as well, too. Okay, mm -hmm. so basically, what we've done because you'll hear ceremonies about getting your leg aids, which is the very beginning process of getting into um, coming into the system. Then you get your warriors for protection. Then you get your hand of ephah, which is to help you with one hand of your destiny. A lot of temples and a lot of elates have broken it down that way so that they could give the student, which is known as the aberisha, or the person who's coming in to learn, to not beat them over the head with so much information because it's a lot of information. Uh, what my godparents do, what we do in our in our in our elay, we give the we give the leg gates, which would be considered to be the note ourself. Then we give the warriors, which is considered to be the cleanse and purify. And then we also give out the hand of E5, which is living in alignment with your truth. These are the three basic concepts to the temple and the institute that I belong to now, which is the Institute of Whole Life Healing. Now, granted, you go to Africa, they don't really do the leke and the warrior process. It's really depending on that family and the area that it's in. Each area in Africa um, depending on what area that you may be in, um, could differ. Depend on the lineage of the family. Could depend on the initiations of the family. Could depend on the Babala of the family, the Olawo of that family, or the Olawo of that area. It could just really depend. So Africa is a little bit different when it comes to its initiations. When it got across the waters and it came to us and it got to America, things we tried to keep it as African as much as possible as much as possible, which is Isheshe. Isheshe is what is known um, for the African spiritual system in Ifa. You have Ifa. Ifa is the sacred science, but you have Isheshe will be considered to be like the denomination, the religion in Africa, the Isheshe. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then, um, but then, like I said, as it went throughout the world, it took on different names. In those different cultures, they came up with different ceremonies, different rituals, put a lot of the culture aspect into it, and that's how certain initiations came to be. Now, when they got to America, again, getting it, being in America and being where it is right now, we've had to carve out things to specifically, to make it specific to the needs of our people here in America, right? Because again, being African-Americans, our culture, and, I, and don't get me wrong, we're taking it from African culture, but things may be a little different from us than it may be in Africa. Things may be a little different for us than it may be in Cuba or in uh, Brazil. So we have to curb out our initiations to how it's going to fit the people that's coming in front of us now. So usually your initiation is really predicated on your reading when you get your when you get your reading. So if you're getting a reading, a spiritual reading, it's going to come through the reading in terms of what you need in terms of your initiation. So people will come and say, hey, you know, hey, Bob Omitosin, um, I will, you know, um, I need I need to um, get a reading. I think it's time for me to initiate it. Okay, well, let's check on it. So we have a way of checking on it by divining on it, doing a reading. If it comes up in that reading that we need to do it, um, initiate that person, we would definitely initiate that person. But we like to go in steps. We like to go in steps because going in steps allows a person to take in that initiation for a good three months, six months to a year. And then after they take it in, then we'll get ready and take them in to the next step because you can't, you can't get people too much again too. like I said before, when we talked about earlier in our conversation, we talked about when the student is ready, the master will appear. So when the student is ready, then we'll take them through those different steps. So initiation for us now is it's evolving now because as you grow spiritually, and let me say this with all due respect, because I love my African brothers and sisters, and we're very, very grateful that we got initiation. And we're very, very grateful that our, our African brothers and sisters even came up or was was blessed with the sacred spiritual system of Ifa. So I'm always going to bow down to our African brothers and sisters, always, without a doubt, because none of us, South America, Cuba, America, 
would even have this if it wasn't for our brothers and sisters. But mm -hmm. as you know, there's a there's another um passage that's in the combine that says nothing ever stays the same, it's always constantly vibrating. That means nothing stands still. It's got to it's got to evolve. Ifa is evolving in a different way. And I'm and I'm saying this to your question in terms of initiations because as the earth evolves, as the energy evolves, initiations have to evolve. So initiations are evolving now to where we're dealing with people's traumas. Because think about it. I'm going to get you to think about it like this. We are the descendants of slaves in America. That's not to say that people in Nigeria didn't have slaves either. or what, mm -hmm. But primarily, we know that story is what I'm trying to say, is that we are the descendants of slaves. So our story is different than a lot of people's story across the world. This is how we curb our initiations, not 100%, but we curb our initiations to really help those who have been through the processes and through the traumas and the hurts and the pains that we've been through in America. Not only were we descendants of slaves, but we had to go through Jim Crow. We were on the plantation. We had to go through the civil rights movement. And there are plenty of other stuff that we had to go through on this, in this country. So you can imagine the traumas, the hurts and the pains and everything that we've had to go through on this continent, right? So I can look in certain odus or in certain aspects of when somebody is coming for a reading and what may have been done thousands of years ago in Nigeria or even up to 100 years ago or 200, that may not work for what's going on in America right now to the African-American who has been pillared and plummeted with slavery, plantation, Jim Crow, Reconstruction era, mm -hmm. civil rights era. Our story is a little bit different. That doesn't mean that we don't come from that, but we have to curb out our initiations to the initiate who's in front of us because mm -hmm. of the simple fact that this particular person, especially if they're African-American. Now, now, we've had white students, and it's, it's really interesting because we have a lot of white people in EFI. A lot mm -hmm. of white a lot of white people are in EFI. You have a lot of different people that are attracted to the African, spirit, the African spiritual science. So you have a lot of white people. So let me just make that clear for the audience as well, that we have not just black people in EFI. There's a plethora of people around the world that's in EFI. But I'm primarily speaking for the African-American. The African-American most of the time, our initiations have to be curbed out to what's going on with that particular person. Now, is there a general overall initiation? Of course, it doesn't differ is what I'm trying to say. It's the same initiation in terms of taking those three steps. You get your leches, which is your beginning process. You get your uh, warriors, which is about protection. And you get your hand of V5, which is about your destiny. You make it through those three. And typically what usually happens after you get through those three, then to start looking at, okay, what do you want to go to next? Do you want to be a healer? Do you want to be a priest, priestess? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to be a garbage worker? Do you want to be a librarian? Because we got to keep, one thing we got to keep in mind about EFI is, is that EFI is not about conforming anyone to a religion. It's about helping you conform to your destiny, period. We're not here to conform you to a religion. We're not here trying to beat you over the head. Matter of fact, we're not even selling it to you. We can talk about it, but I'm not going to sell it to you. But if you come to me and you say, I need to, I need help to understand my truth, then we're going to find out. And then that begins the process to start initiations for this person. If that's the path that they want to go down, they just have to go down that path. They may just want to come for a regular reading and that's it. But mm -hmm. if they're looking to go down the path of initiation, because life is an initiation itself, life, death, marriage, children, fatherhood, all those are initiations. And what does that mean? As my godfather, Baba Kolioso would say, he would say the initiation is nothing more than the initial, the, it, the initial beginning. Because initiation come out of the root word initial means this is your new beginning. So all your initiations are about helping you move into your new beginning, which is to help you understand your truth and your path in life my work as a as a priest is involved with helping people elevate on the planet discover their gifts and tools helping them understand why they're here but my biggest piece of those elements that i just named is about spiritual liberation helping you become free on this planet so that when you leave this earth you become a high you will be a highly elevated energy leaving the planet so that however the universe decides to use your energy next 
it will be highly elevated. That's where my work lies in it as, a, as an awo and as a priest. But initiations themselves are to help people facilitate and help them through life to understand who they are, what they are, and what they're about so they can get them to a place of truth within their life and live that truth for the rest of their life. So each initiation is pretty much basic the same in terms of giving those, those elements that I just mentioned, the know thyself, live in alignment with your truth, and, and the, the purify and cleanse. But once it gets to a certain level, now we got to take this person to a higher level uh, in terms of their of their path and their life when they want to really step into the next part of their life. So that's how the initiations are facilitated. And usually what happens is a person will come to me and just say, I need a reading or I need to you know, see if it's time for me to be initiated. Because sometimes they've been familiar with certain spiritual systems. They've been part of other spiritual systems. So I get a little bit of everybody. I get the E5 folks, I get Christians, I get Muslims, I get people who don't have a religion, I get the atheists, I get gay, I get lesbian, because I don't discriminate. Um, but that's what it's about. I mean, I'm not here to sell you religion. I'm here to help you stay on the trajectory of your path, which is Ochosi that we spoke about today, is to help you stay on the trajectory of your path so that you can be what you need to be in this lifetime, not what I think you should be. But my work is really, truly helping you stand alignment to your truth and your truth only. And, and you say a reading, what does that take place at in the temple? That takes place usually, um, so when somebody wants a reading, we call it a D5. And a D5 is where we actually use E5 to do the energy of E5 to do a reading. And that reading is predicated on um, just helping that person stand in line with their truth. But usually if I do a reading, um, they can give me a call. I could meet them somewhere or they can either come and sit, sit, in, my, sit in my house as well um, and in my temple. And are you speaking English the whole time or are you using Yoruba words? Oh, sometimes sometimes I use Yoruba words, especially when I'm doing prayers. So like if I do my prayers, I might start off and go Omi Tutu, Ona Tutu, Ile Tutu, Tutu Ri, Tutu Mi, Tutu Yi, Tutu Re, Tutu Risha, Tutu Agon, Ashe, 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 Mojaba, Mojaba Oladomari, Mojaba Olorun, Mojaba Fi, Mojaba Lida. Mojaba Ola Damari Ajibo Biku and Belache Ola Damari Iba Ye Tanu. Mojaba Bobo I Male. Mojaba Ola Joani. Mojaba Rum La Lair Yipin Ibikeji Ola Damari Iba Ye Tanu. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. So you just got the shorter version of, of a prayer that we will open up with when I'm doing a D5 for uh, uh, a client. And um and that's just basically opening up the way by calling on the Rishas, um, speaking about coolness, calmness. Also calling on the Most High, all the rune, all the Damari, all the feet that you showed today in the in the um in the slides, and as well as calling on a room a lot to come into the space to help us with bringing that energy down. Because as a diviner, that's what they will call someone like myself and Awo is a diviner, one who taps into the divine energy. Right, my job is to be the mediator. That's it. I'm the mediator. Because everything that a person, when they get a reading, they can really hear themselves or they can really do it themselves. They just don't sit, stand, they don't, they don't stand still enough or sit still enough. But my job is to bring the call on this energy and bring it down so that the person who's sitting in front of me will be able to listen and hear what's being spoken to them. And I'm the conduit that it comes through to give them that information. Now, how, how do you get the name Omotosi? Um, Omitosin came about is when I first got my first spiritual reading. So when I got my first spiritual reading, what was I, 97, 98, somewhere around there? Um, that was a name given to me um, when I first got into the spiritual system. Because usually when you get into Ifa, you know, um, depending on the temple, depending on the Ile, depending on the culture, um, you'll get a name, you know, because when you get in and you get your initiation, you get a name. Or well, sometimes they give it to you before you even get to the initiation, right? So I ended up getting the name Omitosin, which means water is enough to be worshipped. It's an Oshun thing. So water is enough to be worshipped. So it was interesting because I didn't even know that I was going to be a, a child of Oshun because you hear that a lot too. Oh, you know, who rules your head? Oh, Oshun, uh, Obatala, you know, but um, that's who rules my head. But that's how I got the name Omitosin was from my first reading. And what goes into... Um... When when you become a priest, is there a ceremony specifically for that moment? Oh, yeah. When you become a priest, that's the five to seven day process. A five to um, seven day process. Yes, sir. It's a five to seven day process that you go through. 
um, where a lot of ritual work is done, a lot of sacred science is done, a lot of rituals is done based on the African concepts, African tradition, African ritual. Um, so you sit for five to seven days and it's pretty intense. It's pretty, pretty intense and you spend a lot of time with yourself, but there's different types of a priest too. So let me just make that clear as well. You have your Orisha priests, which are called Babaloshas and Eoloshas. And then you have your, the next step up would be um, your Awo. And your Awo priest is an Arumala priest, and they're known as Babalaos, and the women are known as Iyanifas. The Babalao, that, that, that whole term means father of the mysteries. Same thing, mother of the mysteries, right? So once you got past doing the Babalosha, Iyalosha part, then you will move into the next part. Now, sometimes, depending on the reading, because here's, here's the, 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 the craziness of, of reading um, and understanding Odu. Sometimes you may have to become a Babalao right away, depending on your family history or your ancestors or what's coming up in the Odu, right? But typically in the African tradition, uh, which is different than being in America. That's why I said being different in America and being African tradition is totally different because, and even in South America and them places like that too, studying E5 started as a child. And I want to make this very known to the readers out there. And I want to let say that because I want to make sure that my African brothers and African brothers and sisters hear me. The Baba Lyles, the Ola Wolves, and everybody that's in Africa know that I'm, I, I, I understand that process. You started as a child with your family. When you was with a particular family who had EFI or a family that was studying, or let's just say your family wanted you to go study EFI, it wasn't like how we do in America, where, you know, we start at these late ages, you know, 18, <laughs> 19, 25. They started you understanding EFI at a very, very early age. And when they started you off at an early age, you were learning EFI all the way to you was in your adulthood. So they already, so you got these children that were learning E5 at an early age. So by the time they get to be 20, 23 years old, man, they know all the stories, man. They're learning everything. And it's because you got your family and you got that teacher that's teaching you from the time that you're a child. So that's a big difference there. Could, could you imagine, man? Be, I mean, I just say all the time, like, man, I wish I was that child you know, in the E5 family in Africa, you know what I'm saying? Where I could have got that knowledge from the beginning. All of our knowledge, man, comes on the spot, learning. I mean, you, you have to be a quick learner in E5 in America because um, even, you know, because we, we, we still, a lot of us still have those connections to our African families over there, African um, uh, spiritual teachers in Africa, where we still go over and we still get the knowledge, we still get the wisdom, we still get the understanding. They still give us a lot of things that we may not understand or break it down for us and say, hey, you know, I get it. You you may then get it this way, but it's how it is. But we've been very fortunate to still be able to go back to Africa and get that information and still been fortunate enough to be, bring it back and put it in a way that's going to help us in America, too. Um, I'm going to say this real quick, too, is that uh, Baba Obafemi, who's a Awo and Olawo down in Houston, he says it all the time that um, we have to remember that we come from Africa, but our culture is not African. So I want to make that clear to people. Mm. We are of an African element. We love our brothers and sisters in Africa. And I thank them very much. I thank my brothers and sisters in Africa and our elders and our ancestors in Africa that gave us this beautiful system. But at the same time, what Baba Obafemi was saying is, is that we're African Americans. We have a whole different culture. So we're black people, but we have a whole different culture than the black people in Nigeria. This is how spiritual systems all play a difference too sometimes. And this is why when you see in Candomblé and Santeria things change up, is because those are the same black people too that came out of that energy in Africa, but in a different culture now. Culture plays such a primary aspect in terms of what's going to be taught and how it's going to come out. Yes, you have the same elements, but it goes back to what you were saying too, Brother Kiko, is that the literature now becomes a little bit different. Now, if you're in America, you got to fight through all this stuff. But let me say this too. We've been fortunate in America to have some very, very great teachers, Baba Lyles and teachers in America. The One of the primary people historically, he doesn't. He, his name gets mentioned, but not enough. 
He started a village down in Oyotunji Village in South Carolina. Baba Adafumi the first. Baba Adafumi the first also goes his his government name was Walter King. He and he became Baba Adafumi the first over the many years. But he started off in Cuba, got his initiation in Cuba, and then eventually ended up getting crowned as an Oba, a king from the Nigerians, came to America. When that came to him, he was already from here, but started the Oyutunji village for African people, African Americans, right down in South Carolina. He did phenomenal work because he has such a great influence on many people in America. Uh, Baba, Baba Adafumi the first. Um, you had other people like Baba Matahochi, great man, great man in, in Ifa. So we got great teachers who were here and had to go back and get it from Africa and had to get it the way that they had to, had to get it because it was important that they went to Africa and brought it back. But the African influence is, is, is in America as well because we've had great teachers like them as well as other great teachers. Um, Baba uh, F Felina, uh, oh, damn. Um, Hold on. I don't want to mess his name up. Hold on. No, you're fine. Um, Baba Fashina Falade. People like Baba Fashina Falade, uh, Baba Metahochi, uh, and like I said, uh, uh, Baba Adafumi the first, who was really like one of the, the main primary people to bring it back. Because in America, we wasn't getting Ifa from an African perspective. We was getting it from a, a Spanish and a Cuban or South American aspect. But these brothers went and brought it back and gave us more of the African influence, which is very, very important to understand because before then, black people in America were getting it more from a Hispanic point of view. Nothing wrong with that at all. Not knocking my Hispanic brothers and sisters either. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Do, do appreciate it because it could have still been lost. But these brothers, Baba Adafumi the first, Baba Fashina Falade, um, Baba Metahochi, uh, Ia Tish, I mean, I can name a list of folks, man. Um, Baba Falakun and other folks, man, that went and got that African influence and brought it back to us so that we can get, I'm not going to say more of an authentic, but get a more real perspective on what it looked like from an African perspective, if that makes any sense. Now, let me clarify one thing that I said earlier. What you're describing is, I don't understand exactly what you're describing, but that is also the experience in Latin America as well. Like there's definitely, there's definitely even more quantity for sure, because um, it's way more prevalent in Latin America, um, IFA is compared to the States. It, it's way more prevalent. It, it makes sense because the experience was there. Like there was more, there was more of us there than it was here. Mm -hmm. um, and you see even more in popular culture, more positive representation, even in, um, a white Catholicized popular culture in some of these countries, you still, there's a penetration of more positive representation of Ifa compared to here, even. Uh, so, and there are definitely people down there that have those tools that went to Africa. Abjiz de Nazimento, he, when he's writing Sword de Legio and talking about Zumbi and he's talking about Ogun and all these different influences of Ifa, is because he took trips to Nigeria. He went to the motherland. He went to Yoruba land. He went to Ife Ife mm -hmm. um, to take this information back to Brazil. But it wasn't until he took his trip in 78 that he gained this new acquired knowledge because previous to 78, he didn't have that base. It took He had to spend a year there to come back and write his second edition of um, Sortilegio Dois. And if you compare the sort of legio on Gondois, the first one doesn't have as much influence of the Ifa. Mm. It's there, but it's more so the story of Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel, and all the white supremacy in Brazil at the time. Wow. There's more so an emphasis on that with a little bit emphasized in with Ogun at the end with the ceremony with his... um. He gets back with his black girlfriend, Evigenia. Evigenia has a historical mm -hmm. significance. That name does. Um, and some people would argue, is it the Christian version of Evigenia? Or is it mm -hmm. another, is it the African Evigenia, like the Ethiopian type? 
um, vibe. I mean, so you have so much going on because this because I've just studied Greek mythology, he studied Afro um, cosmology, he studied a lot of different things. And so when you're adding all that into a theater piece, it's like, wow, man, this is like amazing. But the second version of the Sortilegio, he clearly tries to make an effort to incorporate a more Afrocentered um, view of his theater piece compared to the first one even now. But that's because he went to Africa, to your point, and had to gain that knowledge going to Africa as opposed to just staying put in Brazil or staying put in Cuba, staying put in South Carolina or wherever you may be in the diaspora. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, brother. It's Again, you know, um, it's going to be very, very coming upon, especially coming down these, these latter part of the years as we get older, to make sure that um, because we always we always talk about um, where this all came from, you know, we try to make sure that we let people know, you know, the struggles with it as well. Uh, but it's very, very important um, as you, you know, as we've been talking about throughout the whole program is to make sure that people really truly understand about how important it is and what we had to fight in order to keep this alive. I mean, it just didn't get here, you know, and that's why it's important that people really educate themselves about the system, you know, because we got a lot of, like I always tell people, I say, just don't get into it, understand it, learn about it, you know, understand the history of it. Because when you understand, when you understand the history of it, you have a greater appreciation for what you're in versus just be a part of it. And like I said, EFA has been great for me because again, I love my African brothers and sisters, you know, it was because of me studying African American history and studying African history in school, um, that led me one of the one of the great one of the many things that led me to it and i'm glad that i did because for so long we were studying you know all these other people's religions you know um ideals and philosophies about what should be good and what should be bad and how we should live life but then when i get to studying kimmit kimmit is one of my babies too i would never throw that away either kimmit was very influential uh ifa was very influential and, uh, you know, even studying the early parts of, of black religion was very influential because I wouldn't have got there without that. I wouldn't have got here without it either. It wasn't about hating nobody and it wasn't about putting another group of people down. It was just like, I need to find something I can relate to because all the stuff that I'm seeing here, it, it, just, it just wasn't making any sense to me. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, I have the opportunity when I'm working with people in initiations and stuff. We're able to educate them. My my godparents, Baba Koliosa and Ieshu Nikki, they're very, 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 very emphatic about teaching the history. We teach we that's one of the things I do. Um before people matter of fact, we got I got a group that I'm working with now that's gonna get initiated sometime in the springtime. But um, you know, I always try to explain to them the history. How did Ifa get to Nigeria? And when you go and read the story, you'll hear the story that Ifa ended up getting to Nigeria by gen by an energy or an ancestor or a region known as Oduduwa. Oduduwa was like the Abraham to Ifa. And Oduduwa, from what they were saying from the research that I've studied, is that they left out of Kemet. That's how mm -hmm. that's how Ifa, that's how all this got to Nigeria, was because they came from the East Coast, primarily like that Egypt. That whole part up that way where you got Ethiopia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And they came down through the bottoms, came past the Blue and the Nile River and came down into that part of Nigeria. This was the migration in a shorter version of it. But the migration was from Egypt. And this is part of some of the stories that you'll hear in terms of how these people got to or came into Nigeria through this uh, progenitor known as Oduduwa, who was like this primary figure in Ifa that really, really uh, started this whole dynasty in terms of the kingdoms and the dynasties and things of that nature as well, too. That's why people have to go back and study the history, because I, I get it. You know, we got the Rishas and we got all these wonderful things, but there's a history to it as well, too, in terms of how the British came in. They invaded, you know, Nigeria and you got all these other folks invading Africa as well, too. And then how does it leave this place? And goes to these other places, but still stay into it, still stay in and 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 intact to a certain degree, because nowadays it's it's changing. I have to be honest, it's changing a lot. I'm not changing, but mm -hmm. these newer people, the one thing we have to be careful about with Ephah is that people don't treat it like a westernized religion. Exactly. Or treat it like the church. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm finding a lot of now is that people are trying to t- treat it like church because they still have that church mentality. Mm-hmm. You can't bring the church into an African sacred science and you can't come in and have the same mindset or the same slave mindset coming in. We're using this to free people. You know, we're taking the history, we're taking these great, great spiritual system of these African people in Nigeria who created this many, many, many thousands of years ago. And that's what I always say too, is that it's going to evolve. It can't stay the same. So it's going to evolve in many, many different assets. And that's why we got to bring Ifa up to the time. We can still keep the old traditions, right? Nothing wrong with that. But like I always say, I'm going to say it again. You know, I've said it before. I give much, much thanks to our ancestors that they were introduced to this. They were introduced Ifa to this group of African people into the world, just like the Kemetic system. We give thanks for that. We give thanks to those groups of people that these systems were introduced and they took it to create a better way of life for people. That's all we're trying to do, but it has to evolve. If the system doesn't evolve, then what happens is we get stagnated and we can't push the people in the direction that they need to go into, in short. I wanted to say, um, I want to give a shout out to two YouTube channels that will enrich what I was been describing as far as um, some of these people like John Henry Clark, um, some of the nigger two thinkers, uh, Malcolm, obviously. You yes. have a lot of the Nation of Islam people. Um, there are two channels. One is called Real Black One. R-E-E-L, as in real, because this person is a filmmaker, real black all together, one. Mm. Real black two is one, two as a backup channel because YouTube has been <laughs> very bad when it comes to suppression, suppression of anything that's outside of the mainstream, anything that challenges the status quo culturally, politically, mm-hmm. socioeconomically, anything that is informing people to think a different way or to find their own way of thinking, it has been censored, like probably more than ever before. And people doesn't, they're not aware of this, but it is. And then Afro-Marxists as well, mm. those two YouTube channels have just archived footage of just some of the greatest thought process you will ever see um, just in real time. A lot of talk about the comedic system. Um, if you... Um, Go on there. The great debate is on there. If people don't know what the great debate is. I think it's Mary Le- Levovitz, um is debating John Henry Clark, who's yeah. debating somebody else. And he basically takes down like three people at the same time. I mean, they're trying to like discredit all he's saying about like the true history of Africa. And I mean, they're just coming out with straight Western talking points. Right. And you and this is going to be uh, this is going to be always a danger as um once you get new acquired knowledge you have to understand we're in the western occidental bubble occidental mm-hmm. bubble is always the occidental bubble is the reason why we're taught to hate china we're taught to hate russia we're taught to hate africa we're taught to hate asia we're taught to be programmed in a certain way but if you factor in the whole world you realize that most of the world isn't Christian. Most of the world isn't white. Right. Most of the world is, there's a whole big, beautiful world out there. If you go out there and see it, it's impossible to see everything. But what they're showing you is just a small corner of the world, which is the United States, Canada, Great Britain, right. wherever it may be. But there's just a way broader world um, out there. And a lot of the thinking that we get, a lot of the philosophy that we get is strictly from Western Europe. North yep. America and the older societies like society itself and the older civilizations, that thought process has been completely co-opted and transformed into something else. Yes, um, what we're getting is like, it's like we're starting over from scratch. And it's like, yeah, let's erase all of like the origins and let's just create something, this Western experiment almost. And that's pretty much what we have now with the political structure and everything else, and they've gotten rid of everything else that was really a part of the original equation. Oh, brother, you you hitting it right on the money. And 
again, this is this is the reason why we have to really, really be diligent about our education and how we're going to move forward. Because if we don't really take a control of what you just what you were just speaking about, um, we won't know anything. We won't we won't have any any connection to anything of what those great master teachers or those great people left behind for us. Um, and I and I totally agree with you in terms of because I I saw that debate with uh, John Henry Clark and uh, Lefkowitz I think her name was, mm -hmm. and um, but we had a cru we had a crucial time where people want to erase our history, you know they want to erase things you know and again that's that programming piece you know we are in a we this this again like I said the the, the biggest thing that I fight as a priest is the programming, because even after people get initiated they still program to a certain degree. And, you know, programming is like crack. You know, people still want to go back to the old ways. People want to still go back to this because, you know, they that this is this is how you've been. This is how you came in. Breaking this programming is is one of the primary spiritual pieces that we're working against right now is programming. It is no joke. It is no joke. And the programming comes into in terms of how people want to control everybody. Um, in E5, excuse me, in E5, we also have a concept called the Ajogun. Now, I gave you the A-J-A-G-U-N, but the negative forces are the, male uh, the um, you have the, the uh, malevolent, the, in the, the negative energy. Those are the 200 plus one. Death, sickness, gossip, and all the craziness that we see in the world. And <clears throat> whenever we do prayers in E5, we always ask to avert death and sickness. So I say, Kosi Ku, Kosi Afo, Kosi Yo, Kosi Fitipo, Kosi Dina, Kosi Lapa, Kosi Ron, Kosi Wahala, Kosi Akba, Kosi Eshe, Eshe. Meaning that we're trying to avert death, sickness, gossip, any negativity that's a, that's not for your greatest and highest good. This is, when I'm speaking in terms of this programming, it's probably the biggest blockage because e, e, there's a word in Ifa called EB. So when I say Kosi Ku, Kosi Afo, we're trying to remove and trying to block the EB, the blockage from coming in someone's life. The EB is the toughest thing we're fighting against right now, the blockage or this programming with people, this negative energy. It's a tough job. It really is because people will go back to the old ways real quick. And that's why we give it to them in three different stages, the initiation. Know thyself, cleanse and purify, and live in line with your truth. Know thyself. Who am I? Now it's tied into the app. Don't get me wrong. It's tied into E5, but we had to break it down a little bit more. Know thyself. That's ancient comedic, but know thyself is very, very important as well. The know thyself is really to understand your energy so can't nobody control it. Cleanse and purify. Traumas, hurts, pains, anything in your family or anything outside your family that may have hurt you or damaged you over the year to where it's throwing you off from getting to your greatest and highest good. Live in alignment with your truth. What is your truth? Where are you supposed to be at? Like right now, I'm seeing you living in your truth by having this platform. This is your truth because you're bringing truth to the world. And I'm using you as an example because this is the kind of things we're trying to get people to is to be the truth. But unfortunately, <laughs> you know, one person see one person do one thing, and I great it's very influential, but people have to realize that sometimes that may not be your truth. It may be lying somewhere else because now with our people, they see things that are very very popular now, mm -hmm. or they do they 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 go with the popular way of things. That might not be your path. You're only doing that because you want attention, you want to get hits, you want to get likes, and all that kind of stuff. That's not your path. So we have to be very very straightforward with people and let them know what the path looks like for them not for me but for that person so going back to your question about initiations and tying this all into what e is really about it's an african science it's a way of life of helping people stay in alignment with their destiny as well as helping people understand their truth that's why we use it other than that i mean of course you can use it for other things to determine the past the future when you're divining but our main main goal with this is to help people become spiritually um, um, liberated. Now, will you say that you use, and just a few more questions before we go, because we have to go definitely at two. <laughs> <laughs> but um, are there um, 
so are you saying that the ceremonies that you're you've been a part of and the initiations and also the readings when clients come see you will you say that they're reflective um how reflective are they of um things that will be going on in Yoruba land itself very similar some things you know because we still have to play catch up so because one of the things we got to keep in mind is that our brothers and sisters when it comes to uh initiation are not as elaborate as the santeria lukumi folks you know what i'm saying they're very straight to the point you know mm -hmm. very straight to the point and and that's how we are we straight to the point about getting to where we need to be at um sometimes initiation can be very elaborate and maybe not straight to the point. It may take them a little bit longer to get there because of all the elaborateness that takes place. But we try to make them to where it has a lot of the African element in it. You know, it's going to veer away from that at all, not much at all. But we will incorporate some things that we think that can also help, which is to know thyself, cleanse and purify, and to also live in alignment with truth. We would definitely do that. And two, we try to listen as much as possible and not do things with ego. So when I do an initiation, I try to involve the spiritual energy of Oludamari, the Orisha, and the ancestors as much as possible so that my ego is taken out of the process and that they get the initiation the way they're supposed to. Because a lot of times we can walk into a situation with a lot of ego and it messes everything up and don't even realize we messed it up. So mm -hmm. what I try to do is we we do a lot of things within nature, a lot. We do a lot of things within nature. We do a lot of initiations out in nature because that's Arisha. Why not go and get the best element to help facilitate with the process, right? Mm -hmm. Why not sit? Why not sit your people or whoever it is? Even people who don't get initiated, they come to me and just say, hey, you know what? I got some issues going on. All right, let me, let me find out what's going on. Find out. Come on. Let me take you out to the lake. Let me take you out to, to, to the trees. Let me take you out in nature. Nature has a way of working with a person, which is the Arisha, without my influence. Meaning that I'm going to be there to, to facilitate, but my ego's not involved. Mm -hmm. Not to say I'm putting my ego in it, but putting... Letting the Dorishas work directly with a candidate or someone who needs help is the best solution, and it moves that person's opinions and everything out of the way, which is what you want. And going to back to when you were initiated as a priest, are there animals involved in this at all? So in Ifa, you have that's that's and that and what I'm. What I'm saying to you is not a uh, secret at all. Everybody knows about that part. Um, nowadays, what's really interesting is you still have people who do blood sacrifices and you have people who don't do blood sacrifices no more. Um, the temple in the Eli I belong to, we no longer do blood sacrifices anymore. And one of the reasons is because uh, great people, great mentors and great teachers like Baba Metahochi said, we don't have to do sacrifices no more. We get enough blood up during the Mayafa, during the slave trade. So why are we giving up blood? Mm. Wow. <laughs> you know, and then now did we now did he say that? But then my godparents, oh my God, man, they got a a, a a saying and a quote for that that just blows me away. So they'll tell us all the time, like the greatest sacrifice anybody can make, you know, because we're always, you know, some let me just say this too to preface it like this. In every religion, they're doing some type of blood sacrifice. Because if you're eating meat every day, you're doing a blood sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? Because that meat was chopped up and drained. Uh, we just know, like in Islam, they call it halal meat because they drain the blood a certain way to eat the meat. Jewish people, they call it kosher meat. You know, res respect to all my Islamic and Jewish people out there as well. Um, but they have certain rituals that they cut the meat in order to drain the blood to eat the meat. That's a blood sacrifice. Because what are you doing? You're sacrificing an animal to eat it, right? Mm -hmm. Get it. Totally get it. But in our ceremonies or in ceremonies now, you're finding people, I ain't going to say a lot, but you find a good number that are getting away from blood sacrifices, right? Because they feel like the the... The notion behind it is, and especially with my godparents, and they say this all the time, the greatest sacrifice that you can make is to go inside 
and kill the blood, kill the animal with inside yourself. So instead of killing the animal on the outside, why don't you go inside yourself and deal with your issues? Because that's the greatest sacrifice right there. Because you get full attention on it, but you have full appreciation for it because you went and you handled it yourself, which a lot of times people can, you could do, take an animal, sacrifice the animal on the behalf of a person, they still go back out and still do the same shit or stuff. Excuse me. They still go no, back you out. Do, and no, you don't have to excuse yourself. <laughs> they, still go back, they still go back out and do the same stuff, right? So my godparents said there is no, we call it elbow, meaning sacrifice. There is no sacrifice or no elbow for stupid, meaning that <laughs> if I make this sacrifice and you don't make the changes, then that was that it don't get anywhere. But there's no elbow for stupid, meaning that if you go do the same stupid stuff over and over again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take no animal's life just because you keep doing the same stuff over and over again. So mm -hmm. the real sacrifice is to go in and take care of it yourself. Or as a priest, we're gonna go in and look at that and see how you can make the sacrifice to get these things done versus then being lazy. And then putting it on someone else or putting it on something else, just like uh, here goes another good um, um, way of looking at it. People go to church every week and they give all these ties and all this money thinking that they're going to be more highly favored than the next person. Or because I give two thousand dollars, I'm going to get I'm going to get fixed. But you're not fixing yourself. Mm. And people are good for that in religions and spiritual systems that they will use something to try to do it for them versus them doing it themselves. That comes, that was, that's the know thyself piece that we are working with with the Leke. It's getting to know yourself, but understanding that if I help you get to know thyself, I'm going to help you overcome some of these things you're going to get through by getting you to take responsibility for yourself, not by putting on an animal or having somebody else do it, but getting you to take the responsibility. That's the greatest sacrifice anybody can make in life when it comes to themselves is for them to go in and take care of the sacrifice themselves by making a sacrifice or making a commitment to really want to get rid of it. Yes. And um, there's, I'll keep this person unnamed because um, I'm, I'm aware of like people knowing a lot of other people. I don't like to throw people under the bus, but there, there is again, exploitative elements of um, IFA. I think that there's good and bad involved, um, even in the commercialization of it. But mm -hmm. that's also a huge danger because at that point, it's becoming almost like a reflection of the baby religions that you were talking about earlier and just some of the tactics that are used. Mm -hmm. um, you got people <clears throat> initiating all these celebrities. Okay, I lied. Charles, I don't I don't know. I tried to get Charles like for interview. Um, I think he's in okay health. He may not be. He's an older gentleman. But um, I was introduced to him through um, a video called Santeria, Fusion of the Gods. Mm. And um, he's initiated like all these Hollywood celebrities and stuff. Mm. Um, but it's like they emphasize so much like the money aspect of it, like the mm -hmm. all the animals that are sacrificed and stuff. And to, to the credit of my student that came in like kind of aggressive about something to you because she's from Miami. She's actually from Hialeah. And it's funny because I was telling them in class about a Supreme Court case that allowed animal sacrifice to be legal in the United States. Right. Um, in the, the 1992-1993 decision um, dealing with the Church of Lukumi, um, Aye Babalu. Mm -hmm. um, versus the city of Hialeah, and um, which is located in Dade County, Miami, um, pretty much um, 97, 98 percent Spanish speaking, um, Hispanic, and um, they ruled it as uh, protected by the First Amendment. Basically, like it's it's freedom of religion, um, you know, it's for religious purposes, spiritual purposes. And so it, it's allowed as of 1992, 1993, but that was a later decision that was made separately that kind of left it more up in the air. But that decision kind of right there when students asked me or used to ask me about that, you know, the whole idea of using animals, I told them that there is a legal um, basis now, you know, that may not have been there before, but um, it sounds like that people are starting to turn away a little bit from that 
um, aspect of it. Right. So let me let me let's talk about this Hollywood thing real quick too. A okay. Lot of people, <laughs> it, it it goes back to what we talked about earlier. E5 attracts people because of the power. So people are not interested in doing the work, and they're not interested in getting it the right way. People are interested in getting it the fast way, and it's just not even Hollywood. It's a lot of people. They don't want to put in the work. See, people fail to realize when you become part of a spiritual system, it requires you to work on yourself from top to bottom. All your traumas, all your hurts, all your pains, all your shortcomings. People don't want that. They want the quick fix. They want, let me let me give you $20,000 to put this title on my name. You know what I'm saying? So they might not even be a real priest, but they'll pay twenty dollars or $30,000 to get this, this title on their name, right? Mm -hmm. But that's just, but it's no different. That's what I'm saying. It's no different than these religions because you get a lot of these ministers now to go out there and pay Thousands of dollars to get doctor behind their name. Ain't never went to school in the day of their life, right? <laughs> or they go through what they would call, my my godfather would say, um, these these paper mill schools where you ain't really doing nothing, but they give you a certificate with doctor on your name and that's it, right? So mm -hmm. people are more caught up by the titles and they're more caught up by the glamour, but don't realize that true spiritual systems, when you come into Ifa, Kemetic, Native American, or any of these are uh, the yoga spiritual system, any of these spiritual systems are out there, they are there to help you work on yourself to become a better being. So that when you leave the planet, you're a highly elevated energy. But these people don't get that. A lot of people don't get that. They just rather pay the money thinking that, you know what, I'm gonna let somebody do the work for me, and you still don't get it. But again, too, that's the kind of society that we live in now. It's kind of like that all over the world, to be honest with you, is that people don't. So there's a passage in Ephah that says, heaven is your home, but the earth is nothing more than a marketplace of suffering. Heaven is your home, but the earth is nothing more than a marketplace of suffering. And there's even an Odu in Iwari Irasun in Ephah where it speaks about how the Rumele were going back and forth between heaven and earth. And they got tired of going back, going back and forth between heaven and earth because they said, you know what, we tired. You know, we tired of going back and forth between heaven and earth because their job primary was to make things better on the earth because it was just crazy. Earth was just going just in some crazy stuff, you know. So when they go back up and they speak to the higher powers, all the Damari in them, all the room, they was like, you know what? You're going to keep going back and forth between heaven and earth until the earth is in the right place. So the gist of the story is, is that our only being for coming into the planet is to make it better than when we came into it. So what people don't realize is, is that if we don't help elevate ourselves, then we can never help elevate the planet. If we're looking for a quick fix in terms of trying to fix our problems, that's not going to help either. The quick fix to the problem is, is the person work them out themselves. They work out them, you know, they work it out themselves. But that's why you get into EFA because divining with your ancestors, divining with the Risha, meaning doing readings or doing readings, for because you can do readings for yourself once you get to a certain level. When you learn how to commune and, 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 and communicate with those Arishas and those ancestors, you would begin to unsolve the mysteries of yourself. And it goes back to what I was saying before, that if when we teach people is, is that we try to get them to, to solve the mysteries of themselves. If you unlock the mystery of yourself, then you begin to unlock the mysteries of the universe and everything around you. But that requires work. It requires a lot of work. People don't want to work no more. People want the quick fix. Let me give you some money. Let me just give you this. And mm -hmm. you know what? As long as I give you the money, cool, fine. And they're satisfied in the mind because they really think I gave this person this money. I'm going to be great. Mm -hmm. No, you can never be great because you're not taking responsibility for your actions. That's taught across the board as well, too. So, yeah, it's it's not a quick fix. And, yes, you do have a lot of people out there that don't want to put in the work. This is our biggest challenge as well, too, is that you're right. It's the commercialization. And now you get all these people on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got everybody's got an opinion. Or got that Now they know about Arisha. Now they know about all this stuff now, right? But never really sat down to understand the system itself or even understand spirituality. But now, you know, you're doing classes on Arisha and blah, 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 whatever. It, it's, 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 it's a mess right now, you know, especially with the commercialization of it. But again, that's what happens. You know, when things, I mean, Modern day ministers, you know, you got these mega churches, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not. And let me just say this, because I'm not just picking on the Christians. 
just at hand. But this happens in all spectrums of spirituality and religion is that when they get start to get in other people's hands and they don't use it for the right way, this is what you get. You know, so we really, really try to use Ifa in a very, very natural, loving, caring, and spiritual perspective to really help people change. I tell people all the time, my only job is to help you change your life. That's it. I'm not trying to convert you. I just want you to change. That's it. And just help the next person. Because I understand what that programming looks like here on Earth. It's not easy. That programming is rough, man. It is. It's no joke. You know, and you get to the point, you get tired of getting beat up all the time. So mm. now you say, how can we do this differently? And that's when people usually come to us. They get beat up so much and they're going through so much stuff in life that they'd be like, you know, I can't do this no more. Can you please help me? No problem. We can definitely do that. Sometimes they come sooner than that. Sometimes they come later than that. But what I will tell you is that, that they will come to you when they are truly, truly beat up at the highest point of their life or they'll come into in the earliest beginnings of their life when, you know, ain't nothing wrong. Before um, I give you a chance to like, I guess, having the final words to my audience. I mean, we've appreciated so much your presence on Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum, this um, wonderful episode 94. And because um, I haven't published 93 yet, um, 90, episode 93 will be published probably tomorrow because I'm, um, I have another interview, episode 95, tonight with Cynthia McKinney. If people mm. aren't familiar with Cynthia McKinney, the former congresswoman of the state yeah, of Georgia. Yeah, she, she was a sharp sister, man. She was she was sharp, man. She's I remember six, her. Mm -hmm, former six-time um, congresswoman out of Atlanta, Georgia. She now lives in Bangladesh. We're going to catch up with Cynthia McKinney, Dr. Cynthia McKinney now, um, later on tonight. But um, yesterday we had a uh, Julian Assange panel. Um, he's he's suffering in Belmarsh Prison in the UK right now for being a truth seeker, a truth teller, you know, being a journalist, independent publisher, and, um, you know, revealed a lot of war crimes, and um, the US government and a lot of world governments didn't like it. So um, mm -hmm. that's what we had yesterday, episode 93. So this is going to be episode 94. And um, it's been a wonderful episode 94. But before I give you a final, you know, um, you know, exposition um, with my audience today. I want to ask, um, when you say according to Ifa, you're not talking about a book or anything, or are you talking about just like oral traditions? Oral traditions and sacred Odu. So what you'll find is that the sacred scriptures are, are, are in what they will call Odu, sacred Odu. Odu is the embodiment of a woman's womb. Um, Odu, Odu was the wife was the wife of Arumala, but Odu represents infinite knowledge and wisdom. In Odu, you will find many stories, many scriptures, signs, and symbols. And in Ifa, when somebody relates and says, you know, in a holy Odu, it would be like speaking to a sacred scripture. So a lot of times we refer and say, you know, Odu says X, Y, and Z. Odu says this. So that's why I said, let me let me go to Odu. Odu, when one of the Odus, and the Odus compromise um, stories, symbols, and language that comes out of the 16 primary Odu, which uh, they call it our, our major, major Odu, Ola Odu. And then uh, we also have 200, it's all together 256 Odu. So you have the major 16, and then, um, and then you have the 240 Odu, which are the the babies, the children, Omo Odu, the child, the children Odu. And these 256 Odus, they have a plethora of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And if you multiply the 256 by the 256, then it goes into the thousands and even more. Oh, so wow. as a priest, we have to learn these Odus and learn the traditions and things of that nature so that when people come and sit upon us, you're still carrying on the tradition of Ifa, Isheshe, and you're carrying on the tradition of the words, the wisdom, and the different rituals and things that need to be chanted or things that need to be given to the client that sits in front of you when they come. But yes, we refer to the Holy Odu as just our knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And Odu is also symbolic of the womb because, you know, all things are born into the into the universe as well as Odu is the embodiment of knowledge being born every day. So that's why we refer to the Odu. Yeah. Um. Uh, was there any um, 
last words do you have for my audience? Um, again, this has been a beautiful episode 94. And I know that my beautiful people are going to appreciate all the knowledge that has been, um, you know, discussed today. And hopefully people can take this information in and they can use it to improve their personal life. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you, brother, for all the incredible work that you're doing. Happy, happy Black History Month again. And I want to give thanks to all those ancestors who really fought hard for us to be able to be on a platform like yours today. I get teary eyed sometimes, man, because a lot of people died, man, for us, man, to even be where we are right now. And um, and I want to say thank you to those ancestors for, again, opening up the way that Brother Kiko could have his platform today and be able to have a, a person like myself on here where I can, you know, speak about as, as much as I know about. Because, um, again, Ifa is a lifelong commitment. It is a lifelong journey. And I tell people, even being a Baba Lao, um, you know, we're not even really supposed to call ourselves Baba Laos. We're supposed to say we're just our woes because it's a process of learning. It's just like coming from Jesus to Christ. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you or or or, or Guatemala Siddhartha becoming Buddha. You know, it's like you have to work for these titles. So I'm I'm very honored that I could get on here and just speak about what I know and the best way I know how, but to also be able to speak with you, such a wonderful and beautiful brother like yourself, because I talk to you all the time at work. And um, we have great conversations, but I tell you, it's an honor to be able to sit across from my brother and be able to speak to him. And we and we can talk in a very, very diplomatic, spiritual, learning for way, because just as much as I'm speaking, I learn a lot from you, too, brother. I learn a lot from, you know, in our conversations. Uh, I'm listening to different books. I got a good just listening to you today. I'm like, oh, God, I got to get this one. Right. But I'm very, very thankful that we have platforms like this and. The last thing I'll just say to the audience, and again, thank you, Brother Kiko, for having me on today. I mean, I really, really appreciate you, man. I more than what you know, and thank you for your platform. And I would tell people out in the world is to study themselves. Get to know who you are. Just don't know your name, your age, your religion. <clears throat> study your energy. You're an energy that has come back into your body for a specific reason, and you're here for a specific reason. And understand that energy so that you can fulfill your mission and, and destiny in his lifetime, as well as breaking the vestiges of slavery off your mind. You know, become free. Spiritual liberation and freedom is the key to anything. I don't care how much money, what kind of cars, what kind of anything that you have at this point in your life. If you are not free energetically and free in the mind, that's not freedom. Just because you got a nice house, nice cars, that does not define who you are. And that is not freedom. Freedom is being able to think for yourself. Learn for yourself and have your own thoughts and opinions about things. And that doesn't mean that you can't learn from other people and grasp and take the knowledge and build on your knowledge. But at some point, it's going to force you to stand on your own and learn for yourself and develop your own philosophy of life. That's what I would tell the, that's what I would tell the audience today. Be free. Well, those are some wonderful words of, of encouragement and and. I just I just want to say thank you so much again for um, accepting my invitation to come on to the show and um, share three hours of your day um, with um, our audience. Like I said, I know my audience is going to appreciate this and just the amount of knowledge. Um, and I've anticipated this episode with a lot of my personal friends and told them because people ask me, what is that? What is Ifa? You know, because people are so curious when they hear things they never heard of before. And it's just, um, I think it's going to open a lot of people's eyes to, um, you know, these popular depictions of um, things that they probably didn't think that they knew about, but they know about. But then just having um, someone with your experience, you know, navigating what you've had to navigate to get to the point you've gone to and just um, hear it from someone like yourself, um, I think that's powerful in itself. And um I think it's definitely going to make it's going to affect enough people to where, you know, it's, it's curious and then they're going to look more into it and then they're going to maybe rethink some things that they had um, before. We all have to combat combat that baggage um, when it comes to information. Um, we're in an information war. And um, we talked about that yesterday with the Julian Assange panel about how um, we have a person that's in prison for telling the truth, a person that's been held 
against their will an Australian citizen that's in a high security prison simply because they told the truth about mm -hmm. all these world governments and their secrets got leaked out and all this stuff that was supposed to be kept, you know, within their brick and mortar, within their headquarters, it got leaked into the public. So it just proves that we're not supposed to know certain things, I guess, um, because we have these information controls in place or whatever. And so that's always the threat against free thought process is um, you always will have people that would discourage you from having that free thought, whether it's a government, whether it's um, some other negative influence. Um, and so we got to keep that in mind as well, that um, it's not an easy road. And I think that's why some people don't want to delve into things more is because um, they understand that if you dig into things a little bit more, you're going to challenge yourself personally. But you're also challenging challenging a system that is in place for a reason to keep you from growing, you know, even more yes, and, and to keep society in general um, from growing in a more positive way. Like it's by design for society to be dilapidated and split into different sectors and different thought processes, not positive thought process, but mm -hmm. negative thought process um, because there's an agenda in place to keep us separated. And so we got to find ways to, um, you know, appreciate our differences and to also learn from each other and not be just so easily discouraged when we see something that's like, oh gosh, I don't know about this. Why come you don't know about it? Just, just, just yeah. give it a little bit of a chance, right. you know, yes, before you like click it off or whatever. And it, But, you know, it's easier said than done, but hey, hopefully people have uh, a positive effect uh, to this interview, to this episode 94. And um, beautiful people, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Um, Cheers. I got to get some sleep. And um, I know my friend, I will have, probably have to get some sleep too. And um, I was going to tell you too, thank you again. And if you got anybody who needs to get in contact with me, um, they can just call me at 615-478-5727. 615-478-5727. And um you know, they can leave me, leave me a message or text me as well, you know, if they got anything in terms of spiritual readings or any help or anything I can help them out with. Because, again, we're here to help the world become a better place. And I want to say thank you again, brother. Thank you incredibly. I appreciate you. Keep doing a good job, man. You're a heck of a teacher, man, heck of a professor, family man. And I just appreciate every aspect that you carry as a black man right now. So stay strong, my brother. Man, I appreciate that. That means a lot. Just um, you you're such a positive person, and um, and I feel the positive energy every night. You know that we talk to each other, and um, and then that's and like you said, positivity means different things to different people. It doesn't matter what label you put on it. If you're doing great positive things, whatever, we need to acknowledge that positivity instead of trying to box things in, box people into certain brackets and categories, titles, and all this stuff. Man, if people are making you smile and you're happy, like take that for what it is. Like, let's not put a label on everything. Like, like we got to stop doing that stuff and just appreciate like happiness while we can have it. Um, yes, sir. Let's talk soon. We would definitely have a follow up interview down the road. So, because yes, uh, there's <laughs> a lot of stuff we could probably branch off into, which will be more um, how does this tie into, um, I guess kind of like the more systematic stuff that we have to deal with um, yes, on sir. a day-to-day -day basis. But um, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and we'll talk soon, my friend, okay? Peace and blessings, my brother. Take care, my brother. Peace. Here's beautiful people. Talk to you all soon. Peace.